what can you say? Who made them? God must have been a fucking genius. The hair. They say the hair is everything, you know. Have you ever bared your nose in a mountain of curls? Just wanted to go to sleep forever. Or lips. When they touched yours were, were like the first swallow of wine. After you just crossed the desert. Tits. Ooh, ah. Big ones. Little ones. Nipples staring right at you. Like secret searchlights. Mm, legs. I don't care if they're Greek columns or secondhand Steinways. What's between them? Passport to heaven. I need a drink. Yes, Mr. Sims. There are only two syllables in this whole wide world worth hearing. Podcast. Why are you, why is your Pacino Southern? I was just he's southern, he's southern in the movie. In the movie. Yeah. I know, but <laughs> and also I just want to say, Mr. Sims, what are you talking about? You're putting more foghorn leghorn on it than he did. I say, I say. I don't think you can help but sound like the Muppet Telly this from <laughs> Sesame Street. A great Muppet. One of a my great Muppet. One a of great the Muppet. undersung Muppets. One of the undersung Telly Muppets. Who was in a lot a, yeah. of stuff. I have yeah. a young daughter. I'm watching a lot of Sesame Street. And I feel Come like Telly it. doesn't get his No, uh, Telly's in everything. Yeah. yeah. Telly Telly is like first draft, like first round draft pick. I agree. Muppet that no one ever kind of puts He's on that He's the Wade tier. Boggs of... of <sighs> Of Sesame Street. Absolutely, he is. He gets on base almost you know every I mean? time. <laughs> that Telly is so true. gets on base. Um, yeah, Telly is amazing. And that did sound more like Telly, a Southern Telly, but I, I liked it. I, before this started, said, get ready for the best impression you've ever heard. And you took me at face value. And you went, oh, I didn't know you <laughs> really, did impressions. I really did, yeah. Well, you do you do, do some good impressions. But I, I do, do think you've never had Pacino really I, in your pocket. Roger, Roger. <laughs> What's going on? That you was do, an early bit. Right? You, well, yeah, you would do him in uh, insomnia. insomnia. Is the one I like doing. I can right. do tired Pacino. He's very little. gravelly. Let there. me sleep. Let me sleep. No, that's not bad. It's not bad, but that's very. Tired I do a Pacino, old. but I, I don't. What's wanna, your Pacino? You got it now. You got like it. from Carlito's way that that last that last monologue. A little do taste. It. The voiceover. Get a little Where taste. he goes. Late night, gonna stretch me out in Fernandez funeral home on Ninth Street. Always knew I'd make a stop there, but a whole lot sooner than a gang of people thought. Last of the poor weekends. Well, maybe not the last. Late night. Sun's coming up. Where are we going for breakfast? Don't want to go far. Late night. Tired, baby. Tired. I mean, the best line I in the movie. I just want to say, you weren't looking at tired. anything. That was verbatim that was right in my head. Off, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. off the dome. <laughs> I, that movie is one year after... Scent of a woman. So he's got Correct. a little he's bit of that, scent left. Yeah. Mm, yeah, he's got a little scent left in him. Because this is like an actress doing Blanche Dubois. We yes, like we've used this as like, an example. Once an before. actress plays Blanche Streetcar, mm. it's kind of you see it in their performance right. for a year. You know, Kate Blanchett Lang. There's at least ten like, percent that they hold on to for the rest. There's of their no career. doubt. We can all I think agree that Scarface, mm -hmm. that playing Scarface, kind of transmogrified. Yes. Pacino into late, you know, late 80s and late 80s and early 90s Pacino, which was yes. at a certain point unbearable. Here's, yes. here's my question. <laughs> yes. And we're going to talk so much about Pacino's it's performance the thing style, to talk about. obviously. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You say early 90s, but then late 90s, you've got Devil's Advocate and right, Even Sunday right. where he is he really is like completely heat right. out of control. Correct. Heat, right. Heat, it sort of works. I mean, honestly, all three of those movies it sort of works. Well, but that, like, well, he doesn't. There's an interview. He did like a 90 Second Street Y interview. Yeah. To talk about Wag the Dog. Yeah. That movie. Oh, yes. the, 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 the De Niro and yes. Barry And yeah. in the interview, he talks about, or maybe he's talking about Heat. Is yeah. he just talking about, yeah. But no, I it's think heat. it's Wag the Dog. And randomly, they ask him about Heat. Yeah. Regardless, he admits that he was coked up the entire yeah. time right. he shot Heat. Right. And right. for years, he would say that was my characterization. Yeah, I like, read the script. I said, like I can't figure out his psychology. But that was Scarface, right? It yes. ruined him in a weird way. In, in a lot of ways, yes. I mean, it's it is what is fascinating about Pacino is what is fascinating about this movie, and certainly this movie being positioned as and becoming the like final sort of like anointment, the long overdue. Here's his moment. Just looking at the fucking poster for this movie. And the poster for this movie has the energy of, you're going to give him the fucking Oscar for this. There's a certain arrogance to the poster or well, a sense it just of says like fate of And it's his, the letters in his name are so spaced out. It's just last name. 
You probably remember. Yes, I yes, do. Of course. But I'll tell you this. <laughs> yeah, please. I get it. I, as an I, actor, I get it. Yeah. I get it. And yeah. I'll tell you why I get it. Yeah. I think he got bored mm -hmm. and paranoid, yep. which the cocaine might have helped with that. <laughs> He's also, he had the 80s and very making Very weird 80s, which yeah, we'll talk yeah. about. He felt, I think, if Frankie and Johnny, he felt, I think, that the dog day afternoon guy, that that guy was a one note thing. And I think he got paranoid. He became more and more famous. And he's thinking, hey, I got to blow it up. Then he goes and does Scarface and people go, oh my God. And he gets all this street cred for it. Right. And but he thinks the that's the real deal. Right, right. And, and people kind of mock the performance at the time, at least in like critical circles. Mm -hmm. But yes, it like a huge cultural impact. Right. And then ultimately people come all the way around to like, I guess this movie's a classic. He was paranoid. I think that he wasn't showing enough range in his work. And that's what he respected in other actors. The problem is he, he hadn't hit the realization that I think De Niro hit yeah. early on, which is like, oh, as long as I'm the most natural delivered delivery actor in the history of acting, I can do anything as long as I just do that. Yes. Through every Presence. performance. I can right. play any role. Yeah. And I can do comedy. I can do drama. As long as I just trust that people love my essence. And as long as I'm just as natural as I can be. And I don't think Pacino ever came to that realization. Or maybe hasn't until like recently. But also by 1980, De Niro has won two Oscars. Mm -hmm. Pacino has won zero. Correct. He's given several of the greatest screen performances in history. And there's no doubt that Pacino feels competitive with of De Niro. Of course. And he starts to feel like, am I too subtle? Like, is mm -hmm. my thing too small? Like, he's kind of like letting other people score in movies where every actor is like, he's the guy. Right. But the Academy refuses to award him. I can see him sitting down prior to filming Scent of a Woman. And saying to the producers, I want to leave no stone unturned. I want to make it without a doubt that this is the greatest performance. It's a really good impression. It's you very know? good. You got it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. Introduce yes. our show, Griffin. Yes. And then I want to continue this line of talking. This is a blank check with Griffin and David. Here's the other cool. big discovery I made the other night. I rewatched uh, Tropic Thunder on a whim a couple nights ago. I hadn't seen it in a while. And then rewatching this movie today, I was like... Downey Jr. sounds a lot yeah. like Scent of a Woman Pacino. Right. Well, does he? He's, he's, right. His quote-unquote black voice. Right. I'm a dude. Right. right, right. Playing another dude. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a podcast about filmography. <laughs> Directors who have early success. You really lose it the longer you go with it. It just goes early on in their careers. <laughs> it's totally telly. Giving a series of blank checks. <laughs> to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. You're also doing kind of William Shatnerian, like, you know, sometimes the checks clear. To, right, yeah. And sometimes they bounce, baby. I, mean, I don't even know what that is. Bounce, baby. It's a main series on the films of Martin Brest. Yeah. Martin Brest. We're right in the middle of his Who directed one of the great, one of my favorite films. Midnight Run. Oh, yeah. Undoubted. Undoubted. One of the perfect movies. It's a very, perfect film. Yes. A yeah. very you movie, too. I feel oh, my like God. You, you, I, 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 I learned right so much that watching movie. that film. You learn everything from that. Everyone I, I have told we're doing it's his best movie. Martin Brest has that response where they just go, well, that's it's just an unbelievable movie. Run. Yeah. It holds up so well. It'll never, that's a timeless movie. And, and gets better every time I watch it. As you said, like, it's a movie you can study and you go, it's all in here. Everything mm -hmm. you need to know about the craft of commercial filmmaking. Mm -hmm is in this film. It's perfection. And, and yeah. De Niro is so funny. Unbelievable. So he's got, he, you know, you know, De Niro sat there and was like, shit, they're pairing me up with Charles Grodin. He's one of the funniest people ever. How, was I, how am I not going to get buried by this guy? And he was like, you know what? I got a comedic bone in my body. Comedic bone or two. But that's like... And then he kind of is funnier... He's Charles kind of, Grodin in the movie. He's also at his at his handsomest, I think. He's, he's so hot. He's really movie. hot in that movie. Really? I mean, we will have yeah. talked about it last week, mm -hmm. but this is Poverly Hills cast. Oh, yeah, right. That's what the The films of Martin Brest. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is a very weird inflection point in his career. I mean, he is a guy who sort of has like a clear sort demarcation point. Yeah. Yeah. Even though this movie was a hit. he also directed Geely, right? Correct. That's, Giggly, that's, yeah. That's the one that kicks him out of the, right, out right, of the out industry. Out of the industry, right. yeah. But this Jesus is... Christ. Right out. <laughs> this thing that happens with a lot of these guys, the most like successful comedy directors in Hollywood, 
who go like, I want to get serious. I want to make a comedy that makes you cry. I want to go Tony. I also think this was, this is the Dead Poet Society era where it's like these kinds of movies are hot. Right, a right, tum- right. Meaningful, a tum- right. Give me a score. Thomas Newman score. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give me, you know, a right. prep school setting. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, someone's going to learn a lesson. But there's something like this. I, I was watching this and I was like, you know what? Green Book winning Best Picture has a lot to do with, I think, a certain percentage of the Academy having nostalgia for this exact era of Oscar bait. Mm. Right. The kind right? of like light, light drama. Awakenings. Right. right. Yeah. A, Which a, is not a light a, drama, but it has some funny stuff. It's Robin a, Williams. A funny drama. It's a light touch. Right. right? Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like a movie where you're like, you know what? It's thought of. Green Book's got a light touch. That movie is. Sorry. Keep no, going. all these movies are, if you look at them, kind of insane. Right. This movie is crazy. But they're like, right. Filmmakers. This movie does not hold up. No, no, it does. I'm glad you agree. It would be it would be tough if you were coming in here being like, guys, I'm here to go to the no, no. Cinema. This movie really does not hold. No, up. it doesn't at all. I was kind of hoping to like it more this time. I I liked didn't. it a little more this time than I remembered liking it, but I do not think it holds up. The other crazy thing with the poster is it's like Pacino in these like dramatic yeah, yeah, spelled yeah. out, yeah, spread out yeah. letters, and then above it from the director of Beverly Hills Cop. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then it's this like just two men walking through a leaf strewn park. Look, I have a friend who hasn't seen as many movies and sometimes, oh, what do you watch? I'm watching Sense of War. And she's like, what that? what's that about? And I'm like, okay, here I go. Is this your <laughs> wife? Are you talking about your wife? No, although she's another one. Yeah. Like where you're like, okay, okay. I'm like, a, a kid in a prep school <laughs> witnesses a prank. It book. is such a hard movie to describe. Right. Witnesses a prank and is weighing whether or not to to snitch on his friend. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's accepted a job. Yeah. Completely unrelated to yes. anything else. Right. As a caretaker for a horny blind veteran. Right. Who whisks him off to a suicide journey in New York. Gotta get pussy and shoot myself. <laughs> Basically. These two plot lines have nothing to do with each other, but the movie at the end is like, well, they're gonna have to. Well, like, we're also, pushing them together. The, the Pacino pussy suicide weekend is a full 90 minutes, and then there's basically a half hour before and after that. Sort of like a Alexander Payne light, you know, kind of. Right social dramedy. Just right. Yeah. The fucking <laughs> intrigue of the balloon prank mm. and the court proceedings. There is a 40 minute disciplinary procedure in this movie that's literally just Redborn going like, now be honest, what did you see? I don't know. Be honest, I don't know. You know over and over again. I like that they sat, that Martin s- sat there yeah. with his casting directors and the producers and they said, okay, they're telling us we gotta cast this kid, Chris O'Donnell. We gotta cast him. We, we have no choice. He's the hot kid. He's not the most captivating actor. <laughs> but this is also famously one of those movies where everyone was up for it. Correct. Everyone right. wanted this part so badly. But we're going to cast him as the protagonist. We need an antagonist who's not going to blow him out of the water <laughs> as an actor. You don't want people rooting for the bad guy. Yeah. And they go, there's this other kid. Yeah. His name is Philip Seymour Hoffman. Real piece of shit. And we think he's good. There's potential. But maybe dead behind the eyes. I'm not sure. It's kind of scary vibe. Sure. Yeah. You know, Versus plays the pain, but yeah. kind of. I think. I think they'll match up. I think they'll have amazing chemistry. Chris O'Donnell and similar careers. And Philip Seymour Hoffman smoked off the. I'm going to throw this out <laughs> immediately. Yeah. What if you swap them? What if you swap I mean, them, man? Yes. Because like O'Donnell in this movie, it is you're watching two hours of a kid in a mop haircut going like. But Colonel, like, right. and you like, hate the handsome, like, no, you hate the handsome guy. No character. He has no On character paper, at all. There is no like, character here besides you, nice kid. You know, Pacino's basically like loading a gun and being like, "Did you get the hookers yet?" And and O'Donnell's like, "Ah, what are we doing here?" Hoffman might be amazing, and O'Donnell's would be a great preppy bully. Th- this mm-hmm. exact same script with the two of them flipped. I'm like, it's probably a three and a half star for me instead of a two and a half. No, it's too long. This movie is... Mm, this is a rough movie. This movie It's a rough movie. The Pacino-ish. The, the, I, I love... Look, I love Al Pacino. Me too. But my God, he's so out of control. This in this. And I'll, and I'll be dead this. honest yeah. with you. Yes. I saw the film and thought, that's one of the greatest performances this I've is why, ever well, seen. So, okay, right, so, so our guest I really today, did. Our guest today. But as I've gotten older... Go ahead. Introduce our guest. One of our white whales of the podcast. White whales. We've wanted you on forever. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. So excited to finally make it happen. It, yes, absolutely. I wonder. I wonder if we should. Is there anyone? I wish you could take a live poll of who people think I am. Oh, great question. 
<laughs> right. Call in. Al Pacino. Being Sounds very critical like of his own career. Yes. <laughs> this piece of shit. Uh, introduce our guest, please. So well, I'm we try- Here's what I'm point. trying to do in my head. The credits of which movies we have covered across the last we have nine covered years. covered a few of your movies. With the great you. David Krumholtz. That's right. Because we have covered. Welcome, David. Thank you. We covered on our Patreon, we covered the Santa Claus trilogy, of which you were in the first two. Correct. Oppenheimer. That's a movie I'm in. Uh, the Judge. I'm, oh, I'm also judge. in that film. You Correct. get your shoes peed on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are you the villainous lawyer? Are you villainous? Uh, to some extent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, whatever. You know. I'm trying to think if there are others that we've covered. I feel like there are. There probably shouldn't be. <laughs> get out of here. Adam's Family Values, we have not covered as long promise. But that's a great film. It's David and I contend, films. one of the yeah. best comedies of the 90s. Mm-hmm. Period. Period. That's a great fucking movie. That's mm-hmm. a film I've seen more than any other, almost any other movie. A sequel that is well, well funnier than the first. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. The original is an actually an incredibly flawed movie. But I've made so many bad movies. You made a lot of good movies. I you made did some something good ones. terrible. I'm sorry to bring it up. Go ahead. I shouldn't bring it up. You stabbed Kelly Martin, you jerk. Um, who, what are you? Are you like a, a Midwest housewife from like 80 years old? <laughs> no, 75 year grandmother? boy who had a huge crush on Lucy oh, Knight in okay, ER. Okay, I was about to say, what's going on here? Ice yes. Storm? The Ice Storm. Oh, that's yes. right. Did we you covered, do the Ice we Storm? We covered the Ice Storm. Mm-hmm. Great yes. film. Very good. Uh, the Mexican. Oh, yeah, the Mexican. We've never we have not covered, but Verbinski we were talking about before. Was he nice? Off mic. Verbinski? I loved him. Yeah. He seems cool. I don't know. He's sweetheart. That might be the full, but we. I mean, I'm just looking at the list. There's a lot more that we need to get around to. So, yeah, absolutely. You are yeah. in the film I saw on my first date. What's that? You want to guess? Harold and Kumar. Great, go to White great Castle? choice. But no, I was I was like 18 by then. I've been on okay. a few dates. Ten um, things I hate about you. Oh, I apologize. It's your first. Date. You guys have never done ten things I hate about you. Well, we yeah, have. We do directors. Gil Junger, right? Gil, Gil Younger. Younger yeah. yeah. Oh, you do directors. So, right. like, yes. right? Like, I feel like we should, you know, we yeah, should, yeah, yeah. We should squeeze that in somehow. What else has Gil Younger done? Didn't he do Romeo? No, not maybe Romeo and Michelle. No, he did something no. like that uh, after. What did he do though? Is he, he did also- a Nier Vardalos movie, I want to say. Oh, did he do the follow up to my big fat Greek wedding? Did he do uh, Connie and Carla? Maybe. No, I think he no. did. Um, I don't know. My Life in a Ruin? No. I don't know. I don't know what he did. He uh, did Black Knight, which I bet you Ben saw. Oh, yeah, Black Knight. Did you Knight. ever see Ben Black Knight, the Martin Lawrence movie? Hell yeah. Oh, that's right. He did Black <laughs> yeah. Knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we have talked about... Uh, he's got a lot of TV. It looks like he does a ton of TV. Doing yes. a, a teen adaptation of Shakespeare series, where that's mm. where we could slot mm. in oh, 10 yeah. things. 10 things I hate about you. Right um, but the great David Crumholtz. Hello. One of our favorite actors. I'm all right. <laughs> You're one of our favorites. Uh, and like 10 years ago, almost, I guess eight or nine, we had just started doing the podcast. We were like, how do we get anyone to guest on this show? Anyone. And I was on a UCB house team. I don't want to brag. I did make a house team. It was a mod team. It was a mod team. A sketch. I did a show. Someone comes backstage and goes, David Krumholtz wants to meet you. Well, that's right. Because I was, you were str- sitting the struck crowd. by how talented you were. It was, you saw the, the one good show I had. Well, can I say something? Yeah. All right. I'm going to say something that I don't think this is going to be received well. Oh, boy. If it's a compliment <clears throat> to me, our listeners are going to hate no, it. No, no. It's, I bristle at some mm. improv sure. stuff. Mm-hmm. I find the L.A. improv scene to be a little taxing. I'm sure it is. As compared to the New York. And, and when I say improv scene, I mean UCB. Yeah. Yep. Um, I have been doing, I've been a guest monologist at Ask Cat mm-hmm. since I was 21 years old. Wow. So 24 years. So I did it when it was Ian and Matt. You've seen the era. Yeah. Horatio Sands and yeah. Tina Fey. And then later on, I took UCB 101, right. 201, and 301. I think this was when. Yeah I, was, yeah, I was having to see shows. Yes. And I also took a UCB writing course. I think that's when. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as a result, yeah. I think some of it gets stale. And in LA, it's very witty referential. Mm-hmm. It's very inside jokey. I'm gonna I'm gonna ref- reference some random '80s movie, yeah, and you'll find that witty. People and it's are just not trying to book a sitcom, right? Out and in it's LA. not the imp- it's not the performers that bother me. It's the belly laughter from the crowd over a referential witty joke. Yes, rather than a, oh, that's clever. 
which is what I'm thinking. Sure. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. But nothing that would make me guffaw. Right. Whereas New York, UCB, I tend to guffaw more, but not even that much until I saw you. Well. And I, you made me fucking laugh hard. And I was like, look at this guy. He's breaking all the rules. You and, and Gil Oziri. Incredibly are so two funny. guys yeah. that so just funny. go fuck it, fuck the high intelligence thing. Let's just fucking be funny. See, so you're you're dumb as rocks. I'm an, I'm a fucking moron, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> it's uh, the crazy bag funny. of hammers on stage. Crazy no, funny. I I did. It was the most successful sketch I ever had. Was the night you saw it, and I was just like, God, for a, for a guy I idolized so much, mm. you couldn't have seen me on a better night, oh, which made me nice. feel really good. But it was a very dumb sketch uh, about a physics professor who showed up to an English class. Okay. Okay. I, and I don't remember this. Everyone corrects you know. him and they're like, uh, actually, I think you're in the wrong class. And he's like, oh my God, I am mortified. I'm so sorry. A thousand <laughs> apologies. And he walks out and then he just keeps walking into the class <laughs> over and over again. Okay. You just do it 25 times. Right. And he just gets more and more irate about the embarrassment of it and then starts pretending he's a different person. <laughs> yeah. Because he's wearing a different hat. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's truly just repeating the same thing over and over again. It felt classic and mad. It was very silly. And crazy. And yeah. I and I, I wish there was more of that. And, and, well, and that's what there used to be in the early days of UCB. We met. You were very nice to me. I go in to record with Ben and David the next day. I'm like, we're getting fucking crumholds on the podcast. Yeah. I'm telling you, but this you is never asked. an you never easy asked. booking. Did you ask? I don't think I asked. You never I think, asked. I think I... I tweeted at you. Mm. Is we don't what I need think to I litigate this. We don't too need to much, litigate. It. The point is, I've wanted you on forever, and then over the years, you and I have like reconnected, reconvened. And We're also like, maybe mm. the only two male actors. This is true. That came out. Yes, against Woody Allen during yes. Me Too, who had worked on on movies. Of we his. are simpatico in that yes. regard. There are these things that would like link yeah, us weird. together. Mm -hmm. You did George Lucas talk show a year mm -hmm. or two ago. Mm -hmm. And then we did our Oppenheimer but you're episode. you're not on that. It's that guy, Watto. I did true. competing Watto. I was in the audience. I saw it. Mm. Yes. Uh, you do a very good Watto. So do you. You do an excellent Watto. <laughs> but then you messaged me when we did our Oppenheimer episode and sang mm. your praises. And yeah. I was like, I'm fucking straight. We got to yeah, do that. was very that's sweet. A good movie. Thank you so much. We got to have you on. Yeah, I, know you've been, I know you've been doing the, the No, you know what? I, to be honest with you, um, shit. I'm sick of hearing myself talk about myself. <laughs> All right. Then let's talk yeah. about uh, Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. I send you a list of some of those things. Yeah, yeah, right. We're doing this. We got coming this. up. Yeah. And you were like, sense of a woman. Oh, yeah. And I say this to David and he's like, he'll be perfect for that as a dude who was a working actor in the 90s. Because of, and I feel like you're setting all this up, what this movie represented as like, mm -hmm. this is acting. This is the new acting. This is the peak of prestige studio filmmaking. Mm -hmm. This is the best actor sort of mentoring a younger generation below him. So happy when he won the Academy Award. Felt like it was so deserved. You watch that fucking ceremony. Mm. And people are like, we did it. It's like Obama winning the presidency. Yeah. yeah. We finally, we broke it. We down got a all trophy in this guy's hands. Yeah. We right. did it. Right. Yes. Hope, and then, yes, we can. And then three years ago, yeah. I revisit the film at home. Mm. Sure. Just randomly. Of yeah. course, it comes on or whatever. And I cannot believe how bad it is. It is insane. I cannot believe it. It is insane. And it has that thing like Green Book where you like describe scenes to people. Mm. And you're like, and this movie was like taken seriously. This is like people cried right. and it got like a standing ovation like, at the Oscars. They, you see, I was too young to be aware of that, right? Yeah. Was this a movie that moved people? Oh, it was a huge thing. It was a big yeah. movie. I, I remember being it, it being like hands down the best performance right. of the year. The movie was treated as a very sort of sweet and profound yeah. exploration of human frailty right. and whatever the fuck. Um, it's really hard screaming. to imagine. And, yeah, and like you said, smell. those were the kinds of movies that were being made. Yes. Awakenings, human frailty movies. Yes. And, and Penny movies Marshall, about well-meaning people that get screwed by life but somehow. Penny Marshall, another example, right? Like mm -hmm. Peter Farrelly, David Zucker, these guys who are like big comedy directors and then they're like, let me I'm, shift half into drama. Let me shift. You know who never did that? Who? I, as far as I know. Mm. Well, he kind of did it, but he didn't do it into, oh, well, we shouldn't bring this up. Who are you going to say? The greatest com comedy director of all time. Greatest? The greatest comedic film director of all time. Not is, saying is, Mel Brooks. Is, no, John, John Landis. Yeah. 
Sure. Now, Landis yeah. did the Twilight Zone movie, which yes. is not necessarily drama. It's creepy, no. sci-fi, horror. There was some drama on set, I would say. And we all know what happened with yes. that situation. Right. But he never said, and and no, you're right. I mean, he never right. said, you know, I should comedy. do a drama. He never did his strike uh, uh, no, right, at sort yeah. of like prestige legitimacy. I met John Landis. Yeah. At a dog park, and I flipped the fuck out. Yeah. And I showered him with gratitude. Yeah. And it was as if no one has had said that to him in like a decade. Really? And I thought that was so wrong. Yeah. Yes, I know he got written off because of what happened on the Twilight Zone, which really, how much can you blame him for that? Probably a good chunk, but not like the whole way. You can't yes. give him, regardless. His, his legendary run director. was Miracle, insane. Un, insane. Insane. But you're insane. right. He never did. He never did the shift. Correct. Yeah. Which I feel like these guys kind of always do. At some point, it's the classic, like, you know, I, I kind of made it to the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. but there's something I don't have. Let me show him. There's a what final bit do. of respect mm -hmm. that only gets anointed. And this and Green Book and, and like Awakenings have that thing where you're like, well, they're like, quote unquote serious emotional dramas with like heavyweight actors but then you watch them and you're like a lot of this stuff on paper feels like bizarre ribald comedy well but but let's talk about what happened after sort of the bill murray eddie murphy thing yeah is dramedies yes big right 80s, like a huge decade Where for suddenly, like out-and-out -out comedy. It, right, a league of their own. Yes. Okay, yeah, sure. So you've got these funny movies that are comedies, marketed yeah. as comedies, but they have tremendous heart. Fried green tomatoes. Yes. Okay. Um, and they, not only that, these are movies that are hugely successful. They make a lot they, of money. They, they drive cultural. The like, proudest product that the major studios are putting out. Correct. Yes. Not made any. No one no. makes those movies no. anymore. They don't exist. No, this they don't is my exist. take on Green Book. They're it's TV a certain movies. percentage of people were just like, fuck, I miss this being the thing 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm voting for this. This doesn't happen anymore. Right. Um. I, I. It is interesting to consider, like, was Tom Hanks single-handedly the transition point there? Mm -hmm. Like, him going from Bachelor Party to mm -hmm. Big as a Bridge to League of Our Own to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. not just creates a roadmap that other actors are following, but almost that like directors are following mm -hmm. and sort of like, we'll build something around a guy like this at a transition point, mm. you know? Well, here's the thing. Battery's not included. Um, another movie, another comedy about robots, another alien comedy robots, about robots, yeah. but very sweet. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. How many directors can really show range in their in their choices very few very few and it, and if anything it's comedy to drama yeah right it's always either drama to comedy or comedy to mostly comedy to drama rob reiner another example of what another we're great about. example yeah. yeah another great example yeah but then the but then there's like spielberg well, yeah. who sure. has gone out of his way to direct every genre yeah and kind of kicks ass at all of them yeah and i feel like at some point you just got to go well he's in his own lane he's that's it's not achievable yes so if I'm a com, if I've banged, if I've banged out five straight hit comedies, mm -hmm. I'm sticking with comedy. I'm not, if someone right. comes to me and goes, all right, listen, this is a story. It's a lighthearted story about a cancer. She's a teacher at an elementary. She has cancer. And the guy comes in and say, you know, I'm thinking, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to direct that movie. I see the draw and then yet, you know, I don't know. Even in, even if it's in the zeitgeist, I wouldn't have done it. It's also after a gap, but it is wild that this is the movie that comes directly after Midnight Run when he's basically perfected his mm. thing. Mm. Uh, two th I want to say two things. One, the thing that Spielberg is worst at is out and out comedy. Not That's that true. he's bad at it exactly. That's true. And he makes lots of funny movies, he, but he's had a tough time. I yes. agree. And uh, the Even terminal, like terminal are yeah. his like two yes. biggest kind of comedy mm -hmm. swings. So Always neither of them totally work. Cast Always me if you can a little bit is kind of like and really love. good. And but that's, that's, that's it's got all his it's sad. you know divorce, yes. sad, right. and Christmassy stuff. Um, the other thing, uh, unrelated, Midnight Run. I love Midnight Run. I got no beef with that movie. It's Perfect one of my favorite movie. movies. But yeah. it is two hours and six minutes long. 
the, the runtime creep is starting to happen. And right. And maybe he's feeling like, yeah, I, I, I could take an, hour, an extra could, hour of that movie. In that Whereas case, this movie, Marvin Dorfler. This movie, kidding? and I'm seeing this right here, yeah. this uh, Scent of a Woman is 400 hours long. It's right. the longest film ever. It's well, until Meet Joe Black, which is 800 hours long. Mm. And this is not a movie where you're like, yeah, no, but this is a roomy story. This yeah. is the opposite of a roomy story. But this is what I'm saying. This movie could start with Chris O'Donnell showing up for the interview and end with saying goodbye to Al Pacino in the car. And you're like, okay, that's like a roomy, so like, there's plenty of movie there. hour, 40 minutes or whatever. Right. There is 30 minutes on either end of just the school shit. Right. That, as and, you well, said, the, the is second kind of half, the, the second, the, 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 toward the latter end, it's, it's the trial, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Which is insane that this movie turns into, into a like a movie. kangaroo court mm -hmm. where James Reborn basically comes out and goes, like, no, I want to make it clear, actually, none of this means anything. Right. Mm. I just set up some desks in our biggest venue. That's <laughs> our biggest lecture hall. And what I does he went, say? He's uh, Pacino. Someone ought to burn this place to the ground or something like <laughs> he that. He says right? that and eight right. other things. Uh, Rebhorn yeah, yeah. is like, I want to make it clear what is on trial today is the moral fiber of our country. <laughs> this case is a microcosm. And once again, I'm not a judge. Yeah. And this is no one's accused of any crimes. <laughs> right. That's the weirdest thing. Like, like, I'll be and a now lawyer. We will put on trial the two supposed witnesses, yeah. not even the yeah. people who did the thing. Yeah. I feel like the direction to. Philip Seymour Hoffman during the trial scenes. Okay, now we're in the trial scene, right? You know you're fucked. Yeah. So like, play it so that you play with that we know you're sad. Like, oh, you're the jig is up and you're caught. <laughs> yeah. Because if you watch a movie, he's so obnoxious through yeah. the whole film. I actually remember watching that film and hating him in that movie. He's hating and being him. like, he's not a good actor. Yeah. Oh, oh, he's sure. overacting. Yeah. All the stuff, and then the trial stuff. He's just m morose. He's just, and it's almost like. Play sad. And he just kind of literally makes a frowning face. And I thought, oh, this is all not great acting, in my opinion, especially with Pacino there. Pacino's you know, going, how can you uh, how can you give such a shit performance when Pacino is kicking ass? Years later, you watch the film. Seymour Hoffman's brilliant. Yes. Pacino Terrible. is outrageously yes. silly and, and, and way out. Pacino there. is at his worst in that scene. Yes. Because you're like, OK, well, he's here. Yeah. So mm. he's going to say something really interesting to turn this all around. And so he's just like, this is out of order. This boy's all right. He doesn't need you. Fuck you. And you're just like, that's it? That's his whole argument? And Redborn's just kind of like, oh, no. Who are you see, again? <laughs> right. The offender, the boy's parents. <laughs> How do we get across? How right. do we get across that being blind sucks? I think we should have a, him just scream, I'm <laughs> in the dark here. I'm in the dark. Because you know why? Because when you're blind, you, you can't, can't see, see and it's like you're in the dark. So I think that's a really great way. I'm in the dark. <laughs> I'm in the dark. I've been watching obsessively all of like uh, Michael Keaton's recent press tour for his movie Knox Goes Away that he directed. And obviously most of these interviews he's doing for his independent film all anyone wants to ask him about is just Batman and Beetlejuice over and, and over the new again. Beetlejuice, right. right. So most of these interviews have become about Beetlejuice and he just keeps saying things to the effect of like, the thing I loved about Beetlejuice as a character that made me like want to return to it all these decades later is you're just like, this is a character where nothing is out of bounds. You can get away with doing anything. This guy has no rules. You can't go too big. You could swerve at any moment. It felt very free. It's basically basically a cartoon. Totally. Where you can where there's no rules to there's no human rules to him. Nothing, nothing human holding him That's down. That's the magic of that performance is you feel his boundless energy and imagination, and everything he does is funny. But also, Beetlejuice is in 20 minutes of that movie, and despite being the title character, he is in no way the movie, the movie's narrative spine. It is not hung on him. He comes in, he's color, he like throws some chaos in, he disappears again for a stretch of the movie. Pacino is in full Beetlejuice mode in this movie where he's oh, like, yeah. okay, so I'm blind, I can do anything. <laughs> That's right. There's, there's nothing I could do that would be out of character. Martin, I was thinking last night, thinking about if he's blind, he's got to have super hearing. <laughs> <laughs> what if I can hear yeah. conversations taking place in other scenes that I'm not in? I can hear the time. So Chris O'Donnell shows up and I say, I know you talked about me in the last scene you was in. He can hear facial gestures. Yes. I can hear your Somehow. face move. Yes. 
He can hear Chris O'Donnell's background. He knows what his parents did. Unprune, unprune your chin, young man. How did you find this out? You're on fucking Wikipedia? Oh my God. Mom and pop store. It's amazing. It's insane. And, and look, look, I have learned from experience that you can be a great actor, but when you're, if you have an intimate scene with someone who's not, yeah. it can make you sort of overplay, sure. overcompensate for what's the not there. Yeah. In Pacino's defense, and look, and I'm not, I look, Chris O'Donnell's probably a wonderful human being. This, this man is not an actor. This man was never an actor, continues not to be an actor <laughs> of any merit. No one has ever, there isn't a single scene in the Chris O'Donnell filmography that someone says, wow, he really surprised me. He really, the irony he's just, is, and he knows it. He knows it. The irony is this is, I think, literally his peak as an actor, not in yeah. terms of my opinion of his yeah, performance, but sure. just in terms of Hollywood being like, is, is this going to be a guy? We're all in like, on this guy. Got Let's a talk about Globe the movie nomination? that this movie, basically the studios went, we need another movie like this and uh -huh. made Son of a Woman. Rain Man. Right, yes. Yes. Rain Man. Right, you've got right. an autistic. Levinson, another fucking example. Another, of what another we're example. About. Yeah, here, here he is. Went from writing Mel Brooks beautiful. movies Except to then making people cry. Cruz yeah. is the handsome guy yeah. who's fucking amazing Cruz, in Cruz that movie. The, the right. better performance is He's one of the best performances yeah. Cruz ever is given. The reason that movie works is Cruz, not Hoffman. Correct. Yes. Correct, Amundo. The first time you watch it, though, you are mesmerized by what Hoffman is doing and the mystery of that character. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't love Rain Man. Rain Man's fine. Like it's, I think Rain Man's it's, pretty, a, it's good. pretty good. Like mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pretty watchable movie, and it has stakes to it. And yeah. it's very, sa it's movie, very sad. And and his performance yeah, is sad. is really hard to like. And they have swallow. a real bond. Whereas in this, O'Donnell really just kind of feels like he's like, I got this horny grandpa on my like, right. You know, like I don't know what to do with. And him. why did so, this happen to me? I mean, right. You, you talk like I when I and I've then once in a while he's like, what's going on with the snitch situation? He's like, I, maybe I'm gonna get out of it. Okay. Let's drive a Lambo. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just back to the other plot. When I watch, like, interviews now with the guys of, like, Chris O'Donnell's class, his generation, yeah, right? Like, mostly, like, the school ties group. But when any of, the, of those guys do, like, retrospective interviews, Damon, Affleck, Fraser, Fraser right. Wahlberg, DiCaprio, like, mm -hmm. all those guys who became A-listers all talk about in the 90s, they were just like, we're losing every fucking part to O'Donnell. Mm, you get right. into the audition room. It was always the 10 of us. We'd see each other. No, Donald was just unstoppable. Wow. It's school ties this. He's in fried green tomatoes. He is in fried green tomatoes. Um, and then the year after this, he's in the Three Musketeers, a film I certainly saw in theaters. It starts and then eventually movie. he's Robin. And, then, and, and, and I think uh, to them. two years, he's Robin. Right, right. They're like, he got the brass ring. He's a superhero right. now. He's leveled up in a way none Which of us can back then to. wasn't a common thing. No, there you, were. You know, yeah, one there of were, these parts emerges right. once a decade. Like, you're not going to get many shots at this. And then it's weird that his career basically is then over. Well, he, he's on NCIS. No, that's the, he he's never bound. stopped working. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But like, even, and obviously Batman and Robin has like such a negative response. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, right, then he's doing Vertical Limit. Then it's like, okay, right. he's like a B action star now. You know, and he's going to TV. I'm opening our dossier of research here. So, as you guys may know, this is based on an Italian film. A novel. A woman. First that was a novel, then adapted into a film. Turned into a 70s Italian film by Dino Risi, who's, you know, a, a celebrated Italian comic director. The actor won Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival. It, the movie was nominated for the Oscar for Foreign Film and yes. Screenplay. Um, got two Oscar, Yeah, screenplay, exactly. Uh, and Brest saw this movie and loved it mm -hmm. in, at the time. Yes. Like it was stuck in his mind back when Brest is basically, like, you know, a uh, AFI student in the mid 70s. This movie you know? seems vaguely unwatchable now. I was trying to the, find uh, it for you this mean, episode. Like, you mean hard to watch? I could not find it anywhere in any form, mm. but I was reading up on as much as I could. And that film's plot seems to be a lot more straightforward. It is like he is a military veteran, he hires a kid to help bring him to visit one of the other men he served with. Oh, and then it is totally revealed that he has the suicide pact. That this is like the final trip, mm -hmm. the weekend. I want to know a woman one final time, and then I'm going to shoot myself. All the fucking school shit, the this narrative around the escort kid, mm. like none of that's in there. Mm. It's seemingly, it's very interesting, and it, I think that movie's a little more overtly comedic, while being a little tragic comedic. 
but it's uh, like Italian is Robert, countryside. Is Roberto Benini the veteran? That's a good question. That'd be amazing. He would be good. And he was he was around in 1970. How do you say I'm in the dark here in Italian? Uh, how would Benini say it? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> It's uh, no, that's, that's Vittorio Gassman. Imagine him trying to climb over the chairs blind. And the Alessandro shit he went through. Momo. Those are the actors. You know who we're not talking about? And I think we need a moment to talk. Why does the movie win me over mm. when I'm a kid? And maybe you too? Sure. The charming, subtle cuteness, adorableness of Gabriel. Well, she's Gabrielle the scene. Mar, I mean, yes. who is sublime on film. Right. And doesn't have to do much. No. She's very cute. She's very sweet. She's very genuine and natural. She's in the For the Love of Money with Michael J. Fox. Uh, she's the, the, yes. the, the female lead in that. That's, that's uh, right after Not a great this. movie, but, you know, she's doing good. She's a cute pie. Fell off the face of the earth. Yeah. Well, Where I, is know, Gabrielle on Noir? We yes. all forget she was on Burn Notice of course. for seven seasons. Like, oh, you know, okay. she... Th that's she, a USA show? That was a... USA, USA Network? Or TNT or one of those. Mm. Um, according to her IMDb trivia, she once held the record in the Guinness Book for World's Fastest Talker. Really? Really? Yeah. Isn't if, that bizarre? For, for it, was that like a movie? Faster than the Micro Machines guy? She competed against auctioneers, sports, sports announcers, etc. I don't know. And the micro machines. I mean, guy. if he didn't show, I would contest that. Record. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah. If he wasn't at those, that, yeah, because the micro machines guy is and Buster Rhymes and Buster Rhymes. Buster yeah. Rhymes very yes. good. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so Brest loves the movie. Mm -hmm. He finds out the rights are available. He's okay. he's casting around for something to do after Midnight Run. Right. You know, yeah. the man takes his time. Right. Um, Five years in between the two films. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, four? I mean, that range 88, isn't it? Or is I it 87? 87. It's 88. Okay. And Sense of War is 1992. Yeah. Um, but basically, he's completely drawn to this. He brings in Bo Goldman, who is an Academy Award Legend. winning screenwriter. He wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He wrote Melvin and Howard. And may I say, it's not a bad script. It's no, not a bad script. It's, it's not a great script, but it is not a bad script. No, the dialogue is strong. Yeah. He certainly asks, yes, a sort of, a, a, and he basically is like, look, adapt this movie, but vaguely. Like, mm, yeah. you can do what you want. I really am just interested in that idea of the central character, the blind sure. veteran. Uh, he watches the movie, and Goldman says, you know, who served in the army, mm -hmm. served in the Marshall Islands uh, after graduating from Princeton, He's like, I remember my first sergeant in the army. I remember my long lost brother who became an alcoholic and had a tragic life. And like, I sort of combine these characters together to make Al Pacino. Like, okay. that's what he's doing, he says. Okay. Um, this kind of like lost character and this like intense drill sergeant character. He's merging into one person. Okay. So that's interesting. Goldman writes it for Nicholson. Mm. It makes sense. It would have been yes. incredible. Yeah. Right. And like, you can imagine there's some sort of last detail in there, right? Like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what about, let's check in with that guy. Right. 20 years later. Right. Combined with, I obviously that comes later, but combined with the, what he later does with Colonel Jessup, you know, you could see him finding the midpoint between the two. Absolutely. Blind Nicholson wearing sunglasses, hitting on women in the streets of New York City. The movie sells itself. It's a huge hit. It's a huge hit. Nicholson doesn't want to do it or is unavailable. I'm not okay. really sure what Nicholson's doing in the early 90s, but I feel like it's a sort of an odd period for him, right? Mm. Like, isn't that when he directs a movie? Yeah. Well, Mars could, Attacks? Well, that's, that's, a that's a little later. That's a little later. Is no. Two Jakes early 90s? Isn't Two Jakes? Yeah, that's 1990. You know, he's okay. doing his own stuff, yeah. I guess. Mm. Um, so Pacino comes in now he doesn't make sense for this character the witches no. of eastwick go on it's a great movie we've mm -hmm. covered it on this mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. um pacino is not really giving military like i would say but here's another example pacino's looking over as his contemporary jack nicholson who at this point also has two oscars mm. like if you're pacino you're like hackman's got two no, Nicholson's got 100%. two. De Niro's now got two. Duvall's got one. Okay, so now here's something I learned mm. working with Alan Arkin. The great. Okay, and I brought this up on another podcast, but it, it bears repeating. Alan Arkin, he was unabashed, bashed, about saying he wanted to win an Academy Award. 
At 65 years old, he was upset that he had not won. Not just, he had been nominated twice, but that he hadn't actually won one. And it really bothered him. It really bothered him. This was him. when you were working yeah. on Slums of Beverly Hills. Hills. And I yeah, thought yeah. to myself, what a thing that is. Yeah. To, to care that much. To sure. care that much that your willingness, it's slightly embarrassing yeah. to go out and say, yeah, but I wish I won an award. Yeah, I'm a great actor and all, but right. I wish I'd won an award for it. Right. Is kind of embarrassing, but I think these guys think like they that. Do. And so you're right, Griffin. He yeah. probably was like, how come I'm the one? It's That's funny to me, especially because with Arkin, it's like he gets those two nominations in the 60s for Russians Are Coming and Heart is a Lonely. And Russians mm -hmm. is his first movie ever. It's like He's so good in those movies. He, but he, he gets a lead a actor nomination for like, his debut film. Which uh, is a comedy, by the way. Yes. It's a very yeah. funny comedy. Which is incredible. Mm -hmm. But like every part of that nomination goes against but like, tradition. My mm -hmm. mom, yes. I think, you know, who is a, a Jewish woman of that generation, is like, you know, this is this was our Jewish, handsome mm -hmm. prince of a man. We mm -hmm. loved Alan Arkin. And, he's and he, could drama, he could do drama, right? he could do comedy, mm -hmm. he could do yes. thrillers. Yeah. And like Catch-22 is this bust. And I feel like by the time you're working with him, it's sort of like, yeah, his star years are... Well over. In, yeah. And oh, like, yeah. His comeback. He was in the Jerky Boys movie. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And yeah. I feel like then his old man comeback where he wins the Oscar, like that hasn't even arrived yet. But He's when kind of that happened, yeah. I knew he was so, so happy. happy. Yeah. yeah. Well, good for In him. my opinion, he deserved it for that performance, but I he really deserved it yeah. for his performance in Slums of Beverly Hills, which He's was also nice. great. So yes. funny in that movie. They owed him. It happened. I was thrilled for him. Yeah. Because well, I knew how he happy, happy he was. But I, I think part he played of that it off. Is, but yeah. My my Who'd theory. He beat, wait, he beat someone. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Right. Oh, right, right, right. the Dream Girls here. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. That was the thing where everyone thought he was going to win it, and it came down to like, well, but all people don't really like Eddie Murphy, and people mm. like Alan Arkin. Mm. Like, my you know. my theory has always been with the dynamic you're talking about, right? Is like the guys who hit such a level of movie stardom, and not just movie stardom, but like respectability. Not only were these guys like leading movies and hit films and working at the top levels of the industry, but people were like, these are important actors. Mm. The public loves them. They're reinventing the rules of screen acting. Mm. They're like mavericks. They're like generation defining. At that point, when you've proven yourself to that degree at a fairly early age, like late 20s, early 30s, and you've proven that you're not a one trick pony, you've been able to do four or five hits in a row. At that point, what you're competing with is, like, legacy, right? Right, right? Those guys are no longer like, I'm trying to move up the mountain to the top of the hill. I want my shot. Right. It's like, what I'm competing with now is, do I go down in history alongside Jimmy Stewart? Right. Like, I do think that becomes the calculation. And for a guy like that, yeah. you're like, if I die and I don't have an Oscar, do they not remember me? I think there is some insecurity where it doesn't mm. matter if you're in the fucking Godfather movies. If you're like, yeah, but I never won. No, I've, I'm sure it weighs on him. See, for me, and call me cheesy, it's not an Oscar. It's the, it's a star on the Walk of Fame. That's what you want? I want the star on the mm. Walk of Fame. You, you can get one, bought, you can right? buy it, yeah. and, but right. I want to have want them to people want to go like, you. I don't want people to like be like, oh, look at it. He bought yeah. one himself. Or, Does he really deserve right. it? I want people to walk past me. Yeah. There are names. Have you ever walked the, oh, recently? Yeah. And you're like, who the fuck? I've never heard. And they're yeah. stars from like the 1920s. Fred Travelina. But they live on forever. Yes. People yes. don't catalog yeah. who won Oscars in their minds, but well, you just take do a walk down the damn street. Do you know what I, the term I use internally in my head that I don't say out loud because I think it's embarrassing? I remember being young and going to some random pizzeria in Chelsea and they had a mural of like the great movies. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like Rhett Butler and like Vito Corleone and the Ghostbusters or whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> that's the dream to end up on the pizzeria mural. I, I do yeah. think that you're is like, a sign of a monocultural fame right. beyond anything You're like, this else, isn't Planet right? Hollywood. This isn't a restaurant devoted to the history of movies. They bought some stock piece of art that's just some of the great movies. Oh, you know what must have been the biggest honor? What? Was like in the late 40s or in the 50s when, yeah. when Looney Tunes. Oh, oh, when they like do a guy that looks like you. Right? No, and it's actually, there's it's one, like there's yes. a cartoon that's right. like Peter Laurie there's and the like, one that's like Edward G. At Robinson. The yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. dude, that would have blown my mind. Yes. I would have been like, there it is. There's my well, Mad legacy. Magazine's one of those too. I feel like mm -hmm. people talked about for so long of like, if you get drawn, by like Mort Drucker in Mad Magazine. That's like something. I, I was in, I, they did a numbers thing. Hey. Hey, hey. You? Yeah, there you go. Can I tell, I don't know if you know this. Mm -hmm. I am, pathetically, this is a thing I admit to you with some embarrassment, but our listeners unfortunately know this all too well. 
I, I suffer from a crippling addiction to a cell phone game called Disney Emoji Blitz. Okay. That is like a sort of... I think I know that. The game. Yeah, I know I know what you're talking about. It's like a Candy Crush-esque matchup, the shapes of the And there is type. a Bernard one, there isn't is. there? Yeah. And when you play this game, you win the emojis that you add to your keyboard. And I have a Bernard. I have an emoji of you with multiple expressions that I send to people if I'm in that mood, if I'm in a Bernard mood. That's a form of immortality that I don't think you can take for granted. Can I say one thing about numbers? Yes. I always liked how... I didn't get to respond to that. Oh, you know what? Well, it's probably I, for the best. I don't think you need to respond to that. <laughs> I always liked the arts and crafts house, the Judd Hirsch's house, all that nice Oh, furniture. it's a nice craftsman house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. All. It I is I just remember nice any time... A very cozy it house. Like, it's yeah. a great house. Mm -hmm. Hirsch, anyway. You would imagine Judd Hirsch lives in that house. He's comfortable. It, it, was, it fit him, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I want to say something. I, I said I didn't want to talk about me, but let's talk about me let's briefly about it, yeah. because I'm here. <laughs> yeah. What I'm learning mm. is you don't want to be an actor's actor. Interesting. See, I'm an actor's actor. Undenarily. Other actors yeah. think that I'm a good actor. Great actor. I even Great. Think. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. You meet, I ran into that, uh, what's her name? The one from Maestro, uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mulligan. Unbelievable actress. Yeah. Knew who I was, told yeah. me she loved my work. No re now that's crazy. That's a, right. I would be that's very pumped. pumped very about pumped about that. Anne Hathaway is another one. There beautiful woman. Yeah. And woman. And uh, <laughs> beautiful woman. Wow, man. Beautiful woman. Um, woman. That's a woman. Son of a woman. I smell her water. And so Hathaway. Well, anyway, literally just smelling so. But here's the thing: I'm not a producer's actor. I can tell you that much. <laughs> that boy, do I know this feeling? Well. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a director's actor. Well, some yeah, directors, I, but I, I think, here I and there, back here that. and there, I push I back on that too. Producer right. studio is well, where I should, they. Fuck I should you. stop yeah. complaining. Now it sounds like a complaint, no, you and can I'm complain. whining. Complain to her. But uh, I'm not a. Um, yeah. What you don't want to be is just an actor's actor. Yeah. Because it makes you know it's like, and the thing is, Pacino for a while, was the actor's actor. He was right. a rare example People of an actor's believe. actor who was also a leading man. People could not, like Dog Day Afternoon, you can't believe that performance. You just can't believe that, wow, he's just, re like you said, rewriting every rule. Yes. It's happening in front of us. He's, 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 He's he's measured and he's and yet he's loose explosive and, and when he needs he's explosive to be, when he right. needs to, but he's holding back in certain points. That he one knows you're like, so oh, he's going big, but he's pulling it off. It felt correct. at the time like this is the biggest he could go, and it's impressive that he's gone this big. But someone, I think he thought to himself, you know, all these actors respect me. Yeah. But I gotta make European financiers respect me. <laughs> well, can we talk and about... And so he started talking like that! Uh, uh, can, can we talk about his 80s? Now that we're getting to the point in the uh, dossier yeah. where breasts... Well, I, one thing I want yeah. to know. Al Pacino obviously never won an Oscar in the 70s. He was in The Godfather. He was in Dr. Afghan. He was in Serpico. He was in Injustice for... Five Pete nominations Dogs. within Outrageous. the 70s. Outrageous. Uh, who, Zero wins. But who beat him for Dog Day? Dog Day is a good year. I'm saying that he would lose this to someone good or someone bad. Loses to someone good. Is it Rod Steiger? No. No. Nope. That's too. That's, that's before. Right. It's seventy six. Like Seventy five Oscars. It's not Ernest Borgnine. No. No. It's, great movie. Um, it's Marty. That's a great movie. Who does he? It's Hackman. In the conversation. No. No. Uh, Hackman won for French Connection, but that's exactly. like two years or, so earlier. Yeah. It shows how much. See how Oscars really don't. It's the Walk of Fame you want. Because that year is. Is that the same year as Network? No. You guys are circling. Same year as Rocky? No. Ooh. What's another big Oscar winner in the 70s? Oh, The Godfather. No. No. Well, God, he's in The Godfather. He's in The Godfather, yeah. right. Supporting rudely for the first movie. But, but come on, come on. He, all right, fine. He lost to, come on. We just mentioned his name. Nicholson for One Floor for the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh. Because it's one of those things where you're like, it's crazy he lost for Dog Day After. Yeah. And you look it up and you're like, oh, it's Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Like, and it was yeah. time for Nicholson to win his Oscar. Mm -hmm. And so there is the weird irony of like, when he finally wins an Oscar, it's for a part that was written for Nicholson. But yes. yeah, no, his 70s are huge. And then right, in his 80s, he does Cruising, which is a huge, strange bomb. Kind right. of a good movie, mm -hmm. I would say. But at the time was a like, you should go to jail. Everyone mm -hmm. involved in this movie goes to movie prison and real prison. Right. Yeah. There's Scarface, which we kind of talked about. Big hit, kind of derided. Long cultural tale. Then he does that movie Revolution that's such a big bomb that he basically goes into hiding. For like six years? Yeah. The only thing he does in like is then Sea of Love in 89. And does he do Love Frankie and Johnny somewhere in that's, there? So that's 91. Like this is when okay. he's coming back. Okay. Like yeah. he comes okay. back out. He does Sea of Love. He does Dick Tracy. Yeah. Does Godfather uh -huh. 3, which he is kind of measured in. 
Like that movie is very flawed, but yeah. he's not like no, out of not. control. Someone, I th well, that's Coppola going. Listen, right. What the fuck are you doing? And it's like it's you're playing Michael Take Corleone here. Like, but and then Frankie Love, and Johnny, and then this is the year where he's in Glengarry Glen Ross, which right. he is fantastic. Fantastic. He gets a double nomination. Yes, this he year? does. And yeah. then this. Yeah. And he wins the Oscar for this. And the year after this, he does Carlito's Way, which put is me on the Cadillac board. Oh, that's such a great performance. But Glengarry you're seeing Glen the interesting shift of like Scarface. He's like, okay, so this is as big as I can go. I'm not going to stay there forever, but I know now. I pushed the wall. Here's the limit. And then he'll like try and measure it again. And then Dick Tracy's like, can I go a little further? But And they're like, we like this. And he's like, great, okay. And Dick Tracy, it no fits. problem. He's in crazy it makeup. It's cra It fits. Supporting role. He's, he's hilarious in that movie. Yeah, right. totally works. Big mm -hmm. boy Caprice. After this, he's in Heat. I feel like... We all love Heat now, but right at the time, people are like, oh, Chino's kind of, you know, off the leash. Heat is I'll fascinating. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You no, I was heat? just going to say, I think the thing that's fascinating about Heat is that it's 70% sort of subtle, naturalistic Pacino, 30% explosive, which is probably the right balance. You have I'm your sorry, like... Sorry, that dinner got overcooked. Uh, balling my I'm wife. I'm going to be so bald, bold as to say, and bald. I'm yeah. also balding. That... The scene, the the big lauded scene the between De Niro, yeah, yeah. Oh, between the, oh, the, no, between the, De Niro, the diner scene, yeah. the diner scene between De Niro and Pacino in Heat mm -hmm. doesn't work. <gasps> wow, there's yeah. those two actors as great as they are yeah. have zero chemistry. They do not speak the same language rhythmically. Interesting. I watched it the other day. I'm telling you that scene. It's a hot take. In my opinion, does not take. work. De Niro struggling in it. Pacino struggling in it. The The words aren't there. It's too serious a scene. You almost want to see a little bit of levity, a moment of like realism and levity. My friend, sounds like you should watch Righteous Kill. That's what you're looking for. I just don't, I don't like it at all. I don't think Pacino took it down an appropriate amount until HBO's Angels in America. Now, I love until his that performance, performance in Roy Cohn. And and I and him. I was relieved that oh look at him he's going small the HBO stuff. going small again I would say that's a pretty big performance it's a really it good is one, but then but there's it, moments there's that are super I mean, sad I think that performance is underrated and then and, he and then an playing Emmy Brian Specter Phil Specter Phil Specter excuse me not Brian Specter Brian Specter's a Broadway producer I know uh, sorry <laughs> Jesus I never Christ saw hi Brian Spector I hope. Phil Specter oh I he's amazing in it. yeah. I saw Paterno, but that's just him sitting in a chair going like, what's going on? Yeah. I guess I know a little bit. <laughs> what are they saying? I yeah. did. <laughs> but this is also like Spectre and Roy Cohn, he's picking real life people who he's a good fit for. And he can't make them. He's prohibited. He has to do the real person. Right. right? Sure, and those sure, people sure, are sure, already sure. a little outsized. So him underplaying them mm. suddenly feels like he's still getting to go big and go small at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. I think that's what was very clever. And then, like, uh, when he shows up in The Fucking Irishman, you're like, here's fucking 70s Pacino again. Yeah. Well, he's yelling his head off in that movie. He is. Which I love. Dale. You cocksuckers! He says that, like, eight, every eight seconds. He's, he's always so good He's in incredible in that movie. I think he's so funny, and he's How very come, sweet and vulnerable in it. This is the movie I want to see. Before they croak. Yeah. Right? Two older ex- Mafia hitmen mm -hmm. are now old and retired. There's no more mafia. They go on one last attempt at a hit. They fuck it up. It's a comedy. And they're both bumbling. And one is just as bumbling as the other, but they pretend that they, it's, it's, I'm dominant in the relationship. No, I'm not. I, you're not. I'm the dominant one. That's the movie. And it's Pacino Buddy and John comedy. Cena. Is it's the pitch? Pacino and Joe Pesci together oh, I mean, wow. as two bumbling. That. Come on. That, that, that never Pesci happened. It's crazy. I'd love to see Pesci be funny. Everybody loves to see Pesci working. be funny. Yeah. Well, he did Bupkis. Yeah, he did Bupkis. I yeah, know. Bupkis. Watch. Good Lord. <laughs> what happened with the second season of Bupkis? Uh, yeah, it was it, it quits, one of the right? few shows to it's be on renewed. Yeah, I know. Why? Yeah. Did people watch it? I think, no. I honestly think Pete Davidson was like, I, I'm what are we doing, doing all this shit about myself. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I think yeah. that was the vibe. I think the third time he makes something about his own life, <laughs> in, starring Academy Island, and Emmy right. Award yeah, winners playing his mom, it's going to work. Yeah. Um, okay. Back to the research. <laughs> Third time's the charm. Yeah. Pacino says the script is the script. I am not improvising this movie at all, except for Hua, which I, when I got taught how to uh, load and unload a gun blind, mm -hmm. which he does in the movie, he's cleaning the gun and all that. 
And that guy, every time he did it, would say, Hua! when he was done. And, and isn't Pacino it was supposed like, to be like hoorah? That. Yeah. Well, no. So it's, it's hoorah. Isn't, no. So isn't that the military thing? So the military thing is kind of just this grunt. Okay. Some people say hoorah. Okay. But a lot of people say hua, H U A, heard, understood, acknowledged. So Al does go all in on. He talks to blind people. And he says to Marty Brest, I, the only thing I'm adding is hua, but don't worry. I'll only say it 25 times a scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only say it as punctuation. I'll show restraint. Um, they thought about putting contact lenses on his eyes to okay. kind of truly communicate the blindness. They decided not to because he didn't want to, I think. I think it's a huge pain in the ass to wear that stuff. I worked with the great Jamie Foxx who did it. He did it for and, yes, uh, and, really. and, and and he was amazing with that. It, I'd helped him and I I it was and you want a little bit of an in with the academy, you go, you know. Yeah. I wore the prosthesis yeah, over my see. eyes. I they literally had couldn't see like, that. They had to, yeah, to right. walk me to the set. Yes. Right. right. He knew. Jamie knew what the hell he was doing. He was oh. fucking winning an Oscar. Yeah, he was winning an Oscar. He was like, I'm going to win this thing. Just put those things on my eyes. So Pacino's thing was just, I just would literally have my eyes be out of focus. I would just let my eyes go out of focus. Sure. He basically is just looking off to the side. That's, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. his, that's his visual approach to <laughs> communicating it's the blindness. It's classic like, movie language for blind. Yeah. I played a blind guy once, in and what? all I did in a uh, couple episodes of a show called Raising Hope, which was on oh, wonderful, yeah. a wonderful, yeah, a wonderful show. great show. And I just literally, they put sunglasses on me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm doing Stevie Wonder. Like, it's just me, <laughs> but it, and, I'm, and I'll talk with my regular voice. Yeah. But the movements and the ha I have yeah. to communicate I'm blind more than just with the sunglasses. Yes. I'm not that cheap an actor that you put the sunglasses on me, you tell the audience he's blind. Right. And that's enough. Yeah. Oh, I did the whole, it's Stevie literally like, here. yeah. I, it's hard to communicate on, well, because it's, but you know, I did, not only did I do the head waving thing, yeah. but I also kind of did that one thing that Stevie does where suddenly he kind of buries his chin and he goes, yeah. mm. <laughs> he kind of, you know what I'm talking about? That oh, yes. Of course I know. What you're I don't know what that is, but he kind of buries his chin. The Pacino anyway. thing is such a classic, yeah. like, old Hollywood blind where it's like, you just look at the wrong place when someone else is talking, but in a way where you're constantly playing to your best angles, catching the light. Here's the thing, though, as Chris O'Donnell said, he's like, I'm working with Al Pacino. This is a legend. He says this many years later. And then he realized basically he never was looking at me on camera. Like he he noticed nothing about my performance. He couldn't give me any feedback. He's always looking basically like three feet to the left of me if we're acting together. So O'Donnell applied his vocal strengths. If he can't, he won't. If he won't look at me, he will hear me. Yes, Damon. Affleck, Brendan Fraser, all auditioned for this part. Wow. I don't really know why they, you know, uh, he says Anthony Rapp, Damon says, like everyone was like really into it. Uh, and then he, Damon has this story about he ran into O'Donnell one time and he was like, how did your audition for Scent of a Woman go? And he was like, oh, it went all right. And they were all just like, oh, you fucking got it. Yeah. Like, you know. This is the thing. They viewed him as like the annihilator. Wow. This guy was a fucking like locomotive mm. clear out of the way. You're only getting fucking O'Donnell's sloppy seconds. Chris Rock says Amazing. he read for it, which is like crazy to Insane. think about. Uh, although probably would make the, the, the prep school dynamic more interesting. Yes. Of like they're really against this guy. Yes. Because with O'Donnell, they're like, oh, this Oregon poor kid. And I'm like, this kid seems like he was born at Harvard Westlake. Like, yes. right, right, right. He's so preppy. Like, um, Bress says he liked O'Donnell's virgin purity. Okay. Uh, like, because, like, I guess Pacino is so uh, jaded and horny that uh -huh. he wanted, like, a very kind of chaste seeming presence next to I'll him. tell you, that's a sentence that's never been spoken. Virgin purity. Breast said he... Breast... <laughs> said he liked O'Donnell's virgin purity. No one on earth has ever no. said those words in no, a row. No, it's the first time. You could first trademark time in that, the history David. of the world. I'm sorry, Mr. Sims. The, bit, the, the other thing that Breast says, Philip Seymour Hoffman gave one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen. It was ridiculous. It was like something out of a Kazan movie. Uh, he's incredibly impressed with that actor. That's the only other actor he really shows. Hoffman out. is my favorite actor of all time. It is fascinating to watch his movies from this era where this was like his stock type. Well, here's of like the deal. preppy asshole, like loudmouth. Right. Sort of obnoxious. Like, yeah. Gregarious. Right. And I just imagine if smirking. you're seeing this at the time, you're like, oh, so this is just like this guy's gonna be playing this forever. Right, that's what he does. He I fits totally into thought this that. Silo. 
and he'll make a good career playing the guy you want to see get punched. And then, so I walk out of that movie going, re- I fucking hated that That guy's actor. so annoying. That guy's so right. annoying. You really got it on your skin. He is yeah. really not a good actor. And then Boogie Nights, and you just go, holy, holy shit. Holy Where's this guy been? This is, this is the actor of his generation. Correct. You yeah. just go, holy. Did you ever work with him? No, oh, I met him once, but yeah. yeah, I never worked with him. Friend of the the show, recent guest James Urbaniak, has a story. I forget whose play it was, but it was some off Broadway play that Urbaniak read for to play a character who was like a demon, and in in some sort of satirical comedy. I just want to say, I love James Urbaniak. A great actor's yeah, actor. The play is called. I love him very much. The play He's is the called best. The Author's Voice. Richard Greenberg play. Okay. And he went and auditioned for it and was like, I nailed that as hard as I possibly right, could. I had everyone laughing. I am like, this as written to a T, or Baniak had sort of built his reputation in the New York like theater scene. He was like, clearly this is mine for the taking. Doesn't get it. It's like, who's this fucking Philip Seymour Hoffman guy who gets my part? He goes to see the show when it opens and he's just like, he is thinking of things that no one else ever would have conceived <laughs> of for this role. This guy is like, like 10th dimensional. And just his, like, th- and I do think there's something too, like, he plays this character so well that if you don't have the context of knowing his craft as an actor, you're like, I hate this guy. Oh, dude, I hated him. They just cast I didn't an just, annoying I, guy. It made me movie. think he was a bad actor in a way because I was like, that is a putrid presence he's on so screen. Weasley. He's such an asshole in yes. this scent of a woman. Him. Yes. Oh my God. He's such an he's asshole. He's worse than in this the movie. other kids, the bullies who do the actual prank. You're like, yeah, yeah well, I get these. They're just no, like, he like you know, is miscreant. sadistic. Yeah. Yes. He's got like a really slimy energy. Oh, that's perfect. God. Yeah. Amazing. Only other thing I want to know in our research is movies 449 minutes long. It, that that <laughs> test. Did that, you say 449? Yeah, yeah. It sounds one like, billion feels minutes like long. It. It's yeah. actually 156. Okay. It's not 149. It's 156 minutes long. That apparently tested better than the shorter cuts. They had shorter cuts. And they said in the shorter cuts, Pacino's character seemed meaner. Like the more you gave him, like the, the more sympathetic he came off. I can sort of understand it. Yeah. But uh, I do think this movie's length is like really punishing. It's really And you like, read boring. reviews from the time and people, people say People like, why is this so They were long? like, it like, is fully one hour too long. And, and I got to say, uh, this is a rough thing to say because I, but Breast hangs Pacino out to dry. Yet another sentence that's never been said. Breast is- hangs Pacino <laughs> out to dry. But, but no, he does. I agree. He does. He does. But it's the, wild the camera that at the is time. on Pacino too much. There's too yeah. much Pacino in this movie, and he becomes sort of exposed. And yet, at the time, it's like in the he's moment, giving it's the, the greatest gift thing. to Pacino. Right. He's finally giving him the vehicle. But, but looking back on it and watching yes. it now, brutal. I'd be mortified if a director did that to me. And yet he won an Academy Award for it. So we're wrong in a way. I've been with this character for two and a half hours. I have no handle on the Pacino character in this movie. Like, what is his character? Lunatic. <laughs> he's he's an angry, old, embittered military man who has gone blind from stress. Well, but except he was also juggling grenades. Yeah, right, that's, correct. That's, that's a real mystery. You get to right. this scene where you're like, how did he go blind? And you're right. trained by movies like this to be like, there's going to be a tragic uh, story. my brother. Or mm. like he was Quezon. abused right. by their father and sure. somehow part of that. There's something mm. where he either did something heroic or he was tortured in a way where mm. you're like, oh, here's the sympathy for this guy. I fight crime in Hell's Kitchen at night. He's crazy because something so inconceivably bad happened to him. And instead you're like, this guy was a fucking moron. He was an alcoholic. He did what the he was. dumb so shit that yeah. everyone told right. him to do. I right. mean, Bradley Whitford, who's also kind of great in this movie, has the line where he says... Uh, he always was an asshole. Now he's just a blind asshole. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That, and I you're remember. like, well, yeah, that's kind of the problem with this movie. Which is a good line, by it's the way. It's a great line, good but line. it identifies the issue with building the movie around mm-hmm. this version of the character, the way they've dramatized him, the way Pacino plays him, is this guy is just kind of insufferable. And the blindness doesn't really have anything to do with it. He's basically a jerk who can do two things. He can be kind of a smooth smoothie with the ladies who will then like dance the tango with him. <laughs> yes. It's not like he sleeps with anyone through through being uh, no. charming in he, this He, in movie. fact, <laughs> talks about the fact that like the, the core of his loneliness and his sadness in his life is like no woman wants to stay with me the next morning. Right, right, right. That right. He, you only see him pay for sex in the film. And, and it's... 
it's a sort of it's so oddly chased the way that yeah, Jackie and he's like sh- that was meaningless. No right. woman will ever love me. Right. I would love to hear a supercut if someone could do it, and I bet if we ask for it, someone will do this. Someone will do this. Put together a conversation mm. between Dog Day Afternoon Pacino saying, "I'm dying over here," and a scent of a woman it. going, "I'm in the dark." I'm in here. the dark. And just them yeah. yelling at. Him. But I'm, di- well, I'm dying over here. Oh, you're, in- you're dying? I'm in the dark here. <laughs> That's the yeah, other- I'm dying over here. I'm in the dark here. It's the other funny thing with Pacino where when you talk about the different <laughs> eras of his acting, you're like, 70s Pacino and 90s Pacino are two entirely different impersonations. They have no commonalities. You just did two entirely different voices. Totally two different It's people. not even like, you know, in the trip where they're like, well, Michael Caine started up here. No, he's down here. Whatever. It's like, I, I ain't listen to me. It's the 90s, baby. Y2K is coming. We got to get crazy before it happens. Like, well, come on. What are you talking about? Like, it used to be, yeah, yeah this totally different thing. It's amazing. Yes. This movie starts with 30 minutes of boarding school antics, basically. You get a pop-in of Pacino for this one extended scene at like the 15, 20 minute mark. And then like minute 30, the plot really begins in earnest. Or I guess the, you know, the quote unquote heart of the movie. But you start at this like very uh, Dead Poet Society-esque, insufferably preppy uh, boarding school uh, you have uh, Todd Luisa with a disconcerting amount of hair. It's mm, actually just yeah. dis- mm. disorienting to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Todd Luisa. Todd Luisa. Wow. Actor's actor. Holy shit. He be- I auditioned for his role in High Fidelity. He's in High Fidelity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Fidelity. And he is very good in that. Yes. I mean, I'm sure you were a cross chip, but I'm, you know. I had a very he's, bad audition. He's the shy one in High Fidelity, though. I'd almost he is. wonder if you'd be better in the I had a rough. Role. I had a rough audition. Stephen yeah. Frears mm-hmm. directed yep. that movie. Yep. Mm-hmm. And read a newspaper during my audition. Sometimes and you feel flipped, like Stephen Frears wrote a newspaper making the movie. Yeah, and not flipped, that one. Flipped the pages quite crisply. <laughs> yeah, during my my read. So I, I had a, I I will out him. I don't know if I've ever told this story before. I had it was a callback bordering on a test for a TV show where Brian Robbins was going to direct the pilot. Oh my! And he uh, spent the entire audition looking at his phone. Hmm. Like, he was just texting rapidly, head fully down. And at one point, I went, should, like, should I start? Because there was just 30 seconds of silence as I was waiting for him to finish texting. And he just looked up and nodded at me like, yeah, you should start. And the second I started talking, he looked back down. I feel like I auditioned for him, too. And I don't know. What movie was that? This was this was a TV show called Blue Mountain State that I think was a Spike oh. TV original. Yep. Boy, it was about remember. a football wow. team. Yeah. And okay. I was, uh, of course, auditioning to play the quarterback. Uh, no, a nerdy guy, <laughs> yeah, some yeah, yeah. fucking sure dude they some, shove in a locker. Yeah, Alan yeah. Richardson Water puts him in a garbage can. Fuckowitz or whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckowitz, you dweeb, what are you doing? I'm just trying to get laid, man. <laughs> Brian Robbins was like, wasn't good enough to make me look up for my phone. Wow. <laughs> that kid had no handle on Fuckowitz. Uh, Todd Louisa is there. Uh, <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman is there. Uh, you got uh, the uh, Nicholas of this dynamic. Sadler is the sure. uh, the bad kid, right? But like uh, Chris O'Donnell is just like this weirdly angelic boy with no personality. Mm. He seems to have no other friends. He's poor. Like that's what we're just like. Oh, person. he's the poor kid. He's and, the scholarship but, like, kid. He's got to work hard. Saintly. No personality. Like you're saying virginal, whatsoever. He, as, he as just Martin sort of Brett stammers said. apologies to people and is right. quiet. He's yes. got this very odd dynamic with the three rich assholes where it feels like they don't fully bully him. Yeah, they're like, ah, you're one of us, right? Scholarship kid. Right, but also yeah. neither party seems to actually like the other. No, because they're jerks. Right. Rich jerks. Uh, James Rebhorn, third build, love to see it. I mean, this Probably is, the best thing about this movie is just James Rebhorn's billing. He's a great actor, but yeah. this is the ultimate James Rebhorn part of like, he's the guy in the blazer who's like, well, you're not following the rules. Like, that's like just, he did that the whole 90s. You must have worked with Rebhorn. Uh, no. That's no. crazy. He but was in four billion movies. I just had a realization. What's that? The realization is the movie, maybe unbeknownst to the people who made the movie, is really about evil white people. Sure. And how they're not all evil because Chris O'Donnell is a good Right. Oh, yeah. White We're person. supposed to walk out of there being like, but like, Chris oh, O'Donnell, you know what? nothing wrong with that guy. Yeah. The but, worst of white people, but... There are a couple good eggs out there. There are. Yeah. I think that's what this movie is trying to say. I think it's Pacino's evil white. Yeah. 
Hoffman. Yeah. White devil. Yeah. And then it's like, there's a white, there, there are white angels, ladies and gentlemen. There are a couple. We have one. It's as if they're saying, yes, white people can be bad. I feel like Roger Ebert has, there's some review. He was positive on this movie. I'm struggling. There not for any, this movie. Is there any ethnic person in this film? That's a great question. Like, is there a single? Pacino is the most ethnic yeah, person yeah. that's in this Think about that. Yeah. There's not a single. Like, I even feel like like the maids in the hotel. Yeah. You know, like the waiters, like every, it's a very Anglo-Saxon It movie. is very. Yes. yes. There's some Roger Ebert review, I think, where he was like, I actually would give this movie another star if this character was revealed to be an angel at the end of the film. It is the only way the movie makes sense. Mm. The character is like so simple, so pure, so unchallenged mm. that to not literally make them an angel actually works against the film. And I had that thought watching this. Where it's like, and and starting and ending with like the the fucking boarding school drama doesn't help it. You want this movie almost to be like, well, of course, and this was a saint sent down from the mm. sky to help Al Pacino to, help, to stop him. The from boy who could this. fly is more believable right. than this because there's no, nothing nothing to this guy. The, the other thing that doesn't make sense to me about this movie is that okay, yeah, he he has this boarding school drama. There's a prank. He's a witness. Then Redhorn's like, look, if you if you snitch on your friends, I'll. I'll give, write you a letter. Let's just make it clear. The stakes of this film, the three rich kids hate that Reborn has a nice car. Yeah, he got a nice car from like the trustees or whatever. So they blow it up with paint. But yeah. they despise him. From the beginning, they're like, isn't he just the fucking worst human being who's ever lived? Look at him in his car. We got to get him back for his car. So they put a giant balloon with a cartoon of him kissing the trustees' ass above a street lamp, above where his car is parked. Uh, and they're setting this up at night when Academy Award nominee June Squibb walks out. Chris O'Donnell happens to be walking by, catches them in the act, is talking to Philip Seymour Hoffman. They both distract June, June Squibb. She doesn't notice the prank, but the next day when it happens, she puts it all together. The prank also is that the balloon is on top of his car. It embarrasses him in front of everybody, and then it's filled with milk. I think it's like white paint. I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. He's embarrassed. It doesn't matter. Moral rod of America. Look. We have to get to the bottom of this. You two are the witnesses. One of you needs to rat on the other one. Or rat on the kids who did it. That's the weird thing. They're not even ratting on each other. No. They're ratting on the kids who did it. One of you must have seen something. Right. And and so he's trying to bribe him with this. He says to Don to Harvard. Right. O'Donnell's like, okay, well, let me deal with that. Then he Give me goes, a weekend to think about it. Goes in his, he's going to be caretaker to Al Pacino, who's a blind, horny, mean veteran. He doesn't have money to go back to visit his family on Christmas, so he's going to spend Thanksgiving break. Oh, right. yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, Looking, yeah. He goes to the whiteboard, and, and of course, there's the postings of jobs over Thanksgiving weekend. Right, horny, uncle. Right, and he pulls problem. down the one. Okay. 20 minutes in, goes and interviews goes Pacino. His... Pacino reads him for filth. He walks out. That went horribly. You got the job. You got the job. Fine, fine, fine. Then Pacino's like, we're going to New York. We're going to stay at the fucking plaza or wherever they go. That's like minute 35, 40, the movie basically beginning in earnest. Now here's actually what this movie is. But then this character acts like he's king of New York. Right. He Even though he's from the people. South. That's what I just couldn't understand. Because mm -hmm. like, it almost makes sense more if it's a Jack Donaghy style, like some old master mm -hmm. of the universe who mm -hmm. used to go to the plaza and the Rainbow Room. And still knows all these old guys. And he wants one last hurrah. Yeah. But like Pacino's character doesn't even really fit in. No. It's like he was in the army. Like that's that's it. We don't really know anything else about him. No. He's there's, not like a high society guy even. I don't no, know. No, what is Another, super revealed? Sorry, sorry. No, yeah. no. David, I'm Another please. formulaic mistake. Mm. <clears throat> because they had two formulas to choose from. And they, I feel like they chose the wrong one. Is there's the moment in the film where he basically tells Chris O'Donnell, you are a weak, mm. nothing... Mm. Piece of crap. I don't need you. You're not yeah. helping me at all. You are no good. And you'll never. And okay, so at that point, you go, well, Chris O'Donnell's going to come back and prove to Al Pacino yes. that he is strong. Mm -hmm. and that he No. No. They go the other way. They go, Al Pacino feels bad. Yeah. So now Al Pacino has to come to this kid's rescue yes. to make up for the mean shit he said to him. You know, I wanted to see Chris O'Donnell rise to the occasion and prove to the old military guy, hey, I got some balls. Does he yeah. ever do that? No. no. The most he does is he kind of wrestles the gun out of his hands when he's trying to kill himself. And he's sort of like, you're going to have to shoot me. 
but the scene is so devoid of any like you well, know Pacino nothing's gonna is happen. like my life is terrible I got nothing to live for and Chris O'Donnell makes his big stand trying to argue why his life is worth living mm. and I'm not saying that Pacino's character should commit suicide mm. but if I'm in his position O'Donnell's speech does not sway me I don't it think O'Donnell worse. presents a makes single worse. convincing argument I agree he's like well look there uh, there's a sun in the sky uh, 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 you can eat meals uh. by the way yeah. your impression of Chris O'Donnell in this movie is better than your impression of Al Pacino that's in this movie I'm brutal gonna that's the right. meanest thing no ever. no that's a good Chris O'Donnell yeah. I, I don't know yeah, yeah I'm telling you right but am I wrong spe his speech is like am I wrong no, you're not Did right. Did I at just all. hurt Griffin? No, you're it's right. No, 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 you're, I, I'll take it as a compliment. Uh, yeah, no, O'Donnell never like you're you're similarly waiting for some reveal of what drives this guy. Mm, yeah, and the most you get is he doesn't really like his stepdad. Right. My dad left, and my stepdad we don't get along. Why? Eh, he's just not a great guy. <laughs> Any anything like really dramatic there? No, he's just like kind of a dick. And Pacino early on is like, hey, listen, kid, you should fucking rat out those guys because they won't hesitate to rat you out. He's correct. Who he gives the right a shit? The They're situation. masters of the universe. Right. You've had to build yourself out of the dirt. Why, why not? Like, there's no stakes to this in a way, right? Like, there's no moral integrity in, in the situation Chris O'Donnell's in. He's done nothing wrong. These guys suck. Yeah. At the end of the movie, he doesn't snitch. The only like, stakes, job, I, I will guess. say, the, there is... Is Pacino going to do the right thing? Yes. You know. But by the right thing, do you just mean be nice to Chris O'Donnell? Stand up for him, help him out. Which yeah. he does. And Which you're he like, does. thanks, thanks. Pat and that's why you win the Academy Award right there. I, because yeah, it's, I, yeah. I think it's that. It's him saying hua. It's him being deserving. It's the dance. Award. And it's the tango. And by the yeah. way, I remember how they promoted and how they marketed this film. Hua was very much a part of it. Oh, it was like their catchphrase. That right? was their catchphrase. Like, the they went with Hua. saying Hua. Yeah. From yeah. Alaska to Hawaii to Florida yeah, yeah, yeah. to Maine. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you. I'm curious. And if there's a way to if there's a way to figure this out, I don't think there there might not be. What other movies came out that month oh. or that weekend? Oh, we, oh, I'm going to oh, say well, gonna I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess one. Okay. I'm going to say Big Top Pee Wee came out that oh. month. And I don't know why I think that, but something tells me that was around Big Top Pee Wee time. I'm sorry to tell you, you're a couple years off. Oh, that shit. was 88. This movie was 93, 92. 92. This film came out Christmas 1992. Like, like wow. that was, position. Wow. Right. That so was, Miracle on 34th Street, the reboot. That's the remake. Like, that's maybe like a year later. Look, wow. I mean, like, they, 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 look, David, this is the box office game. We're going to play it. Okay, okay good. Yeah. Uh, we're I didn't realize that was what a thing was we in do. theater. It's no, a big no, 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 thing. It's, it's a big thing. It's been codified into law. But that, this look, was a, this, I like, I've never listened yeah. to this podcast have, once. This that's was what we a, love to hear. I'm sorry. This, I apologize. Oh, it's that's true. I don't listen to podcasts. Don't apologize. My friends do. It's a check in your positive box. I don't know how someone sits and listens to a whole podcast. Well, I walk. You walk. Yeah. I don't walk anymore. Um, this is Universal's big holiday movie. Like mm -hmm. the, and I, it's an R, right? Because this movie's got swearing and oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, yes. But still, I do feel like it was kind of a like old and young can enjoy scent of a woman, right? Mm -hmm. like, it's an R that a, you take your mature kids to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because like, they'll learn a lesson about integrity. And it's not, this is not a lurid movie, particularly, apart from him saying like titties. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, it's not like <laughs> Mm. Nipples. <laughs> uh, there's no real violence no. in it. There's, you know, um, the big stakes are: is he going to be a gentleman to Gabriel Anwar? Yeah, yes, he is. You're, you're, is he going to drive yes. this Lambo into a wall? No, of course he's not. Is it a Ferrari? I forget what it is. But am I wrong in thinking that you look at all the marketing material of this movie and it's like Universal proudly presents the movie that is going to win Pacino its Oscar? Mm. Like all of the marketing material has the energy of like, Hua. this is what this movie is designed to do. 100%. Undeniable, right? And now when we get that kind of like obvious, this film is a vehicle to give an overdue ask actor their overdue Oscar... It's usually the thing of like, oh, still Alice plays at a film festival. It's a scrappy indie and Sony Classics buys it because they're like, we can fucking win off mm. of this, right? It's crazy hard. It's like that kind of thing. It gets done in sort of like a gritty, smaller indie character drama way versus a studio being like, we're building this whole thing as like a monument to Pacino. Right. It's, it's, the, it's they see the movie and they go, wait a second. Yeah. This is this is all we got. We could campaign. And if we just campaign with this, we could win the whole shebang, the right. whole enchilada. There's good. But will. it means that other thing other films they made that year yeah. that might have been it, it did, the, not, the, the, yes. did not did not turn out. out well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Are there other scenes we want to talk about in Sense of a Woman that matter? Many. Like, well, then, like, let's hit some. You know, what do we well, got? Well, I think uh, this thing I'm interested in of, of these directors doing this, like, broad comedy to, like, uh, tragic comedy jump. The thing I find interesting is so often, as I was kind of saying earlier, the premises still feel on their paper where you're like 15 degrees in the other direction. This is still a broad comedy, right? Mm. The basic setup of this movie is kind of adventures in babysitting, right? It's like uh, uh, Pacino's uh, niece says, like, look, it's an easy job. We're going away for Thanksgiving. He's just going to sleep all day, watch TV, just sit in the house and watch him, right? They leave and Pacino's like, we're going on a trip. Right. Right now. Get your coat. What? One whirlwind weekend. What are we doing? Getting pussy. Right? And then like a day into it, he outlines what his plan is. Because O'Donnell starts noticing like, hey, you're acting like Jack Donaghy. Hmm. What's with the limo and the hotel and the $25 cheeseburger, you know, and all this shit. And then he outlines like very specific plan. Here's my weekend. Ends with me shooting myself in the head. Yes. And it's then really just like get food, stay in a fancy hotel, see my older brother who hates me. Right. Stir some shit up. Bullet in brain, you know. Sleep with like, a woman. Yeah, I said uh, get laid. I said, did I not say that? Okay. Uh if I'm Chris O'Donnell, it's like it's like my friend put me in charge of dogs sitting there like yes. very old dog. And they're like, that dog barely does anything. Right. Just mm. give it food twice a day. Mm. Right. And then you're just like, this dog better not fucking die. While and then I'm the like, dog's like, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> exactly. O'Donnell's like, I bark, just, bark. <laughs> there's no way to blow this job except the guy shoots himself at the plaza. But the I'm going to say, it's, like, it's gremlins. <laughs> it it's is, don't but this is what feed said. him after it's midnight. This broad Be harmless premise. if you just don't feed him after He's midnight. He's like a what about Bob, like dilemma character. Mm. That this movie is like piling sentimentality on top of. Where this, like, you know, straight man kid is stuck in a position where it's like, I got a handful. I don't know how to manage him. What do I do with this crazy guy? But the stakes are like, I'm, no, but I'm very serious. Here's my loaded gun. And it's very much about a square yes. being taken into the wild side. Yes. Right? Like, this kid has no idea, you know, what it is to, you know, Flirt a, with a woman. Flirt with a play Russian roulette. <laughs> with, and survive. We juggle some grenades. grenades. Yeah. <laughs> juggle some grenades. Let's do it. So we'll make this very clear. I'm going to take him to class real quick. For anyone who did not watch the movie, the reveal of how he blinded himself is that he used to juggle grenades for fun and yeah. to entertain. As, as like an entertainment His act. troop. And one day he got so confident that he was like, let me pull the pins out. And blew up his best friend? Yes. Killed my best friend. And, and fucked up his eyes in a way and that... And the left Lord left it that my friend died and I lost my sight. But, like, conveniently has no scarring. But let's talk about the right. logic of that. Right. That's correct. It the logic look of that. you're Perfect. juggling the goddamn thing. Yeah. How, how are your hands still there? Right. Your eyes are fucking, like, blown to smithereens. Did it blow up midair? And if it did, wasn't it in front of your face at right. the moment that it blew up? And wouldn't that have destroyed your whole correct. head? Yes. The other thing is, he has his gun... <laughs> And he's like, it's my service. I never give it up. I'm like, they didn't take your gun away after you were caught throwing grenades around. Uh, yeah, I'd take fucking everything away. I wouldn't let you hold a <laughs> like, pencil that after that. A, it's not just a sort of like, well, it's time for you to retire. It's like you blew someone up in the American base. Mm. You're supposed to throw those at the enemy. By the way, like doing a bit. Doing a bit. Not even like an accident in training, uh, you know? But. Before he does all this stuff, they do go to White Plains. They do have the worst Thanksgiving dinner with Bradley Whitford and uh -huh. various other people that uh, ends with Al Pacino putting Whitford in a chokehold. I actually like when he puts him in the chokehold because you're like, he is, he does actually have this guy dead to rights. Like, that's mm. the one time you really feel him it's also, like, like dominating Whitford's the saying scene. all these shitty things right. about him and he's just taking it. But the thing that makes... Pacino it, pounce on him. He's calling him Chucky. Right. Yeah, right. And you do kind of like that moment yeah, where you're right. like, okay, this guy's integrity is like, as much as he's been giving this kid shin music, he doesn't like anyone who's a snob, mm -hmm. who's disrespecting others on, on baseless grounds. Or but whatever. in that moment, let's assume that there were hundreds of kids that call themselves Chuck. Yeah. That were watching that movie thinking, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Chuck's not a bad name. There's a homicidal doll sitting in the front row of the theater going, am I really <laughs> that bad? No one wants to be associated with me? So what? I kill a few people. 
the next <laughs> big thing is the tango scene, which I oh, do yeah. think is the most compelling scene in the movie Absolutely. because of Gabrielle Anwar. She's amazing. She's, got she's the so juice. cute. Man. She's so cute. She's so charming and, and she's charmed by him. Right. It's, the scene and she's work. forgiving. Yeah. It's right. It should be like, they're being a pain in the ass. Like this right. girl's waiting for her date or whatever. And instead you're like, no, she's into it. And I believe that she's kind of just like having fun with it. She's the There's key no to that film. To I'm telling you, she's the key to the success yeah. of that film. Yes. I think she's you know, pretty high on the billing order. I, she had a decent career. She's in, you know, she's in some good movies. I don't, mean, I don't know. No, I, don't know. I mean, she didn't have the career she yeah, deserved. Yeah, she maybe didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, is that his Oscar clip? The, the tango, tango scene, or is it him screaming, I'm in the That's dark? No, it's, it might be dark, but it might be, it, it's, uh, it's, this whole place is out of order. That's the scene. Right, the, you know. Oh, if I was to I'd take a flamethrower to this play. That's, I'm a lawyer now for some reason. That, that's the thing that's so weird about like the ending of this movie is it feels like they're like, let's them do a little injustice for all, right? Yeah. Can we have them play all the hits? Right. Yes, no, no, that's. I mean, He's like doing a medley of Pacino mm -hmm. shit, you know? Right. And now I, again, I, this is a, I'm being going to be openly critical of Pacino in this film. There's scenes like the tango mm -hmm. and then later the Ferrari where yeah. he's, ah, I love this. Yeah. And then he communicates depression like a robot running out of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> like there's multiple times in the movie. Yeah. He's like, I'm starting to feel sad, Chris. Getting real sad. Right. And he's literally, literally stooping. Like he just starts to look down. Yes. And it's communicating like, oh man, 10 more minutes of this and this guy's putting a gun to his head. See, but I also thought he was just uh, running low on Jack Daniels. <laughs> yes. Mm. I wasn't sure if it was depression <laughs> or it's just he, 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 had an, he like had finished one bottle and needed another. Am I wrong that he calls it John Daniels at he, some point? He does. He does. He, likes he knows names. him like that. He's not going to call him Jack or Chuck. Griff, he, he knows guy. him like that. He knows him like mm. that. My dear friend John. Like, there's four different times in this movie where he's like, "Gonna kill myself," <laughs> and he's like, "Donald's like, ah, oh, let's go rent a car." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that is the vibe of this weekend. Yes. Is that he's not even really enjoying it? No. We don't mm. see him having sex with the escort. He's perfectly polite about it, but like, did he have a good no, time? No, and it comes like, after the Anwar moment where it's sort of like, he's like, watch, watch and learn, son. Like, you don't understand women, right? Goes to this woman, where, what are you doing sitting alone? My boyfriend, he's running late. Well, let me dance with you. Does this whole tango, right? And you're like, oh, wow, he's going to romance this fucking beautiful young woman. Or he's going to like introduce her to Chris O'Donnell and they're going to fall in love. It's to the movie's credit that they're like, no, no, no. Shitty like, boyfriend shows up moment. and he's yeah. like, oh, thank you for dancing with my girlfriend. And then... Pacino just feels like sad and dejected. And then you basically just see like yada, yada, yada over. And then he like called some escort. They slept together and the she left. Driver. And then he was really sad the next day. It, beg it begs the question, because in a way, it's the reiteration of blindness is awful. Yeah. yeah right. This, this like movie you, is you are you it's a prison. <laughs> you can have the best time. You're like going to drive a Lamborghini down the street. You can dance with a young woman, <laughs> tango. Yeah. But ultimately blindness fucking sucks you're and like you're reminded of your blindness at all yeah. times now what if they took the blindness out of scent of a woman it wouldn't be called scent of a woman no because the whole idea that's it's, that's also by I the way smell them. kind of yeah it's an but, insane but, title it's an insane Again, title describing the plot yeah. to my movies, like, but let's oh, say we take the blindness smell real good <laughs> yeah. right it's like taking the divinity yeah. out of the bible yeah let's take the blindness. It mm -hmm. becomes an allegory. It's a much better movie yes. about a guy who has to live down his demons. Just a guy with like PTSD. Who blew up his fucking friend. Guy. Exactly. Yes. Right. He blew up his friend. That's enough. Right. It's enough. You can make a whole movie. Oh, he's this fucking, he's a bad guy, man. Yeah. He blew up his fucking friend. He didn't feel bad. He, you know, he was like, Jesus Christ, this is his redemption story. The blindness ruins this movie. But I would argue is also so cartoonish. the right. additional the Oscar, act, actor of bit. I don't oh, think he, he wins the people. Oscar for the version you're describing, Correct. which is undeniably a better film. If not mm -hmm. a good film or a great film, yeah. a better film that probably would age better. But the extra 10% of like, God, Pacino, you know, he just like, the way he holds the bottle... Right. You know, there's all that shit that you just, like, you watch it now and you can just see people studying this in 1992 in every acting class. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you can tell he thought about every choice he makes physically. And so that's exciting, I guess, to see. Now, remake of Scent of a Woman, they have to cast a blind man. 
a blind actor. But no blind person, you know, would want this. No, it's, I agree yeah. because they're going, "Hey, I have a good life. I've, I've, yeah. of course, I, like, I work on staying positive. Yes, and, and, and you know, and this movie is about a guy who he goes who, blind late in life and mm -hmm. sudden, like you know, it's not mm -hmm. like the circumstance all blind people face or mm -hmm. whatever. Like you can sympathize that. But you're right. It's it just this kind of, I'm a monster. But it's also why the Whitford line is like hits so hard yeah. where you're like, you're well, already an asshole. Right. The, the blindness is kind of just like the whipped cream on top of your thing. Pre social nice. media, mm -hmm. yeah. people believed that there's no way that a blind person could be happy. Right. Post social media, people are like, oh, you know what? Uh, a couple of my friends are on uh, all are, different people and, live and, all different and, types and of lives. lives. Right. That's right. So this movie doesn't work. Like, no, this just happens to be a very upset guy about a bunch of other shit. Right. And on top of that, he's blind. Yes. This yeah. movie is disgusting. This movie sucks. <laughs> it's it's a mo it's a disability movie in yeah. which we're meant to go to to feel awful. Yes. For the person who has the disability, it's not one of those where you go. He just he succeeded despite his disability. It's one where you walk out going, God damn that poor son of a bitch. Yes. You know I. This movie is, it's wrong. I agree. Now, this is what's fascinating. Martin Brest has made three great movies up until this point. So you like Midnight Run? Love Midnight Run. I feel like Beverly Hills love. Cop. Love. Unbelievable Beverly Hills Have Cop. Have you seen Incredible. Going in Style? What's that? Going in Style. It's so good. I highly recommend. Is an old man robbery movie starring George Burns, Art Carney, okay. and Lee Strasberg. I know exactly what this movie is. I did not see it. it. I, rules. You can watch it today. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. easy, easy to rent or whatever. It's... Great Queens movie. Great, mm -hmm. like, you know. I'm kinda, from Queens. I know you there are. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Where are you from in Queens? Uh, I'm from uh, Forest Hills, Hell Queens. Yeah. yeah. Not the rich side of Forest Hills. I'm from the streets of Forest Hills. Yeah. There's a very rich side of that neighborhood. There's, I'm not, I had nothing to the, do the with that. The rough side of the Tony hill. King. I was on the dark side of the the train track. Literally. Yeah. There's a train that, the Long Island Railroad. Oh, yeah. Through. I was on the wrong side of the track. Yeah. That's right. right. Great movie, uh, highly recommend. Like, never, never lets it turn into you know get too cartoonish, right? Never falls. Yes, uh, all three of those movies are just movie. like perfectly balanced, measured, judged. Do not take themselves too seriously. All comedies, all right? comedies, but have more depth and human insight than you expect from that type and of. And then comedy. he says, "I'm going to make a drama, and it's the most illogical, yes, hard to believe, yes. insulting, cancelable, disrespectful to." blind people movie ever. But he gets a Best Director nomination. It is nominated for Best Picture. He gets the credit for being the guy who finally wins Pacino, his Oscar. is a hit, although I was surprised to it see... It wasn't like a hundred million dollars. No, type. no, it was but it was, it was a big hit. It was yeah. a hit, and it was certainly culturally a big fucking movie. And much like Pacino, this is a case of like, we've talked about so many times on this podcast, people who like get a little broken by a failure a bomb, a folly that like they can't handle the response to. This is the weird example of a guy kind of being broken by a success where he was rewarded for the wrong things in a way that I think just like then recalibrates him to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like if this movie hadn't worked, he might go back to comedy. He's like, you know what? I tried to do my thing. I now know what my zone is. Right. And yeah. instead because he's like, he is bat shit insane. Yeah. In uh, in the uh, what is it the kid the 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 Keanu Reeves the 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 the, the Keanu Reeves oh, the the Devil's Advocate Devil's Advocate yeah he yeah. is bat shit yes. insane because it does the I same remember thing watching that movie. he's like you want more I I remember yeah. watching that movie as a huge fan of Al Pacino sure yeah. which I've always really been yeah and thinking fuck like he's lost he's it. fucking lost his right. fucking mind yeah he he has he why didn't someone stop him. And I've seen a lot of performances of a lot of actors where yeah. you go, I wish someone had just stopped them yeah. in the moment and said, hey, you know what? Eh, take it down a notch for this next one. You just you know, don't try. use those takes. You just don't use those takes. Or you, or if that's all, you got it in the moment. Say, it's a bit much. I know you're Al Pacino, but it's a bit much. But that's the example of like, yeah, you let Pacino do a take like that just to see if anything interesting comes out of him to get it out of your system. And at a certain point, it feels like everyone was always either using the single most insane take he did of every piece, or he only ever was delivering it that well, way. And or, it's proof positive yeah. that even the world's greatest actor or one of the world's greatest actors can still suck, can still totally suck, because acting 
has no parameters. It's not, uh, uh, yes, there's a craft to it, but it's, it's a matter of degrees, be, be, of, 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 of subjective degrees between the worst actor in a porn movie, let's mm -hmm. say, and Robert De Niro and Marlon Brando. It's a matter of degrees, and they're incalculable degrees, and that is why I stand firmly in my position that acting is not an art form. It's not an art form. What do you because think? in every other is. art form, yeah. you can judge things based on certain parameters. Even uh, in abstract art, you can do it in terms of the, the layout and, the, and the, the color schemes and what have you. Acting is not an art form. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's a form of expression. Mm -hmm. It's like birds shrieking in the jungle, right? It, it's, it's like, hey, I'm here. Listen yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to hear myself yeah. well, to know I'm alive. I'm realizing, I don't, obviously, you acted as a young man. Like, how did you get even into acting? Like, was there a way? It was life with Mike. Like, how does this one become story, an actor? This yeah. story's been oh told, God. but I'll oh. tell it again. No, you don't have to. No, I'm happy just... to. Very thrilled to, actually. <laughs> oh, wow. No, because you know what? I, I did a... Uh, <laughs> I did a podcast recently. Dude, I've been doing so many of these. I'm so, this is my, this is my second to last one. I just want to say, I've been on this press tour for this movie, Lousy Carter. Yes. I'm, and, and. We'll be good streaming, Lord, rentable now by the time this comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's already yeah. Okay. streaming. Yeah. And, uh, I'm done. I, I don't like hearing that. I hate myself and so much. Also and it's did. made me hate myself more, which you I didn't think was possible. You had to go through the whole award season gauntlet well, that Jason thing, I'm tired. Yeah. I didn't like this to begin with. Yeah. I don't like myself to begin with. <laughs> We're big right. fans. Can you, you but know, I recently told this story. You're an A-plus guy. Yeah. Just, oh, just that's, We're giving I, you a couple A-plus. Yeah, but people don't deserve me. Um, <laughs> well, that <laughs> that is a hey, really good point. There, that it, is. Is. there it is. You know what? I'm hiding the light back under a bushel. You guys can't see what's under Society is at fault here. That's right. Um, let me, let me, I told this story and they cut it. Mm. So I'm going to tell it again. Great. Cause and hopefully you guys don't cut. This is a brief story. I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Ben told me no, to cut to stand down and stand strong. No desire to be an actor whatsoever. 13 years old going to school in Queens. Sure. Junior high school, Wish seventh, school. seventh grade. The Halsey junior high school. Hell yeah. Which the Ramones and Simon and Garfunkel yeah. went to. And no desire to be an actor whatsoever. No thought of it, mm -hmm. of being anything at all. Do you like movies or like? I am. My dad and mom have been divorced since I was two. Uh -huh. My dad does not know what to do with me on, on weekend with his weekend custody, other than take me to every movie, to, to two movies a weekend. So the whole relationship's built around that. Correct. And yeah. he won't take me to any R-rated movies. So yeah. I'm seeing every PG-13 comedy when mm -hmm. I'm seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. I'm seeing all of them. And maybe an R-rated comedy here and there as I'm getting older. Okay, I'm seeing mostly comedies with this my This is like dad. late 80s? This is mid, no, mid 80s. Okay. Early 80s to mid 80s. The whole 80s. Sure. Is, and early 90s is just me and my dad, Saturday, Sunday, a movie a day. Okay. Right? That's what it is. I'm learning so much. I have no idea what I'm learning. My grandmother is a super funny, talented lady. Literally doesn't, has never explored that but is quite a character. She's teaching me comedy. My whole family's funny. Who gives a shit? It doesn't matter to me. I don't know what I want to do with my life. I'm 13. Who gives a shit? And I decide to take part in the school play, which was a production of Bye Bye Birdie. The director of the school play happens to be my English teacher. Okay. At junior high school. It's early 90s. They're starting to air commercials where instead of actors telling, you know, selling you a product, they're going out on the street and interviewing people. What do you think of this product? And using real people's interviews as their commercial. And this new thing happens of real people are more interesting than actors. Yeah. So they go, hey, with kid actors specifically, we don't want a kid that is too trained. Doesn't act like a kid Correct. in a movie, acts like a real kid. So they cast like private parts, young Howard Stern sure. on an open call. Yeah. Open calls. Yeah. Which is anybody can come in off the street. Yeah. You don't have to have an agent. You just like put flyers up at local schools. Car at local schools. Right. Very rare thing that they were doing, right. but they were doing it. Because we and specifically want kids who just sound like, look like, seem like people. a kid off the street. Correct. Yeah. yeah. They come to my teacher and they go, hey, there's this Broadway play. 
big part in Broadway play, Judd Hirsch's son. We're looking for someone who can play Judd Hirsch's son. My teacher comes to me, says, you're a funny kid. You look like Judd Hirsch. I know who Judd Hirsch is. Yeah. I love Dear John at the moment. You have that leg up on people where you're like, I understand who I'm playing Oh, yeah, against. absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I yeah. love Taxi. Had, had you done Bye Bye Birdie at this point? Correct. Who'd I, you play in Bye Bye Birdie? Randolph McAfee, the, the son of the family. I sing kids. You sing kids? kids? Well, I don't know what's wrong with these. Anyway, Billy Eichner was also in that production. In that same production with you? Correct. Who did he play? He played... Albert Peterson? He played my father. I'm pretty oh, sure he played my father. That. Yep. I'm pretty sure. I may be wrong, but he was awesome. Ed Sullivan. Me and Billy went to school. We grew up together. So Billy and I go and audition for this play. He also goes in. He doesn't look a damn thing like Judd Hirsch. No. But he's a little Jewy kid from Queens. Sure, sure. Yeah. He could play John Larroquette's son. Long story short, six <laughs> yeah. weeks of auditioning. Every Damn. time I go back, there's less and less kids. It started with like a thousand kids mm -hmm. from all over the city. Before you know it, it's down to me and Jason Walliner. Wow. The director, yes. Jason Walliner. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Many comedy. Who was a professional actor yeah. kid yeah. and was in a Saturday morning cartoon, a commercial that would air. Yeah. A commercial for a toy that would air during Saturday morning cartoons. Which toy? So, I don't remember, but so much so that I walked in, saw him at my audition, and became petrified. You were right. like, that kid's like, a big that's deal. The this fucking, kid's got micro machines. Yeah. He's got, that's the kid. <laughs> he has the whole collection. Correct. And he's telling me to collect them all. Anyway, I get, get the, the friggin' part. part right. And yeah. I'm on... What's the play? It's called Conversations with My Father. Mm -hmm. It ran for a fucking year. I did six months. All of a sudden... I am an actor. Yeah. Herb Gardner. On Broadway with a large part in a Broadway show. The show next door is a show called Falsettos. Mm -hmm. The guy who wrote and directed that show is about to direct his second movie, big first studio movie called Life with Mikey. Yeah. He sees me in that show. He goes, hey, I'm going to put you in Life with Mikey before you know it. I'm making a studio movie. That's a movie basically about child actors. The producer of that movie right. is going to produce a movie called Adam's Family Values. Yeah. Before you know it, it's I'm just on set. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. The writer of Life with Mikey wrote my first TV series. I do that TV series. The director of that TV series, of the pilot of that TV series, directs The Santa Claus, his first movie. Wild. Before you know it, within three years, yeah. I've made three studio films, a Broadway play, and a TV series. Yeah. And I hadn't wanted to be an actor. Right. I had no clue. It hadn't what happened was. by accident, but there was no intentionality to insane. it. Insane. Yeah. And my family and I are like, this is insane. But we know it's insane. A thing you're kind of like learning on the job. I knew. Yeah. I knew I was good enough and I knew I knew a lot about movies. Yeah. I knew that like, I remember on the Santa Claus thinking, if I could just do like a Bill Murray thing yeah. in moments here or whatever. Yeah. You know, like n grabbing from You understood that. the language of it. I did. Yeah. It wasn't a problem. And thank God, man, I'd be, I'd be dead. Do you know what? I like would be dead if I wasn't, if that hadn't happened. No doubt about it, I'd be dead. No doubt. You just don't know what, like. No, I, 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 I was not a kid. I was, yourself. first yeah, of all, my fa family did not have money. Yeah. I, at all. I was not a smart kid. I didn't do great in school. I was mm -hmm. a lazy student. Uh, harder. Later on, I fell in love with weed and alcohol, and I would have totally gone farther. That would have been everything, right? Correct. Yeah, I, yeah, I would have yeah. done. If I would have gone to that head. without. The, if I was, the career I either at state. would have become yeah. a lonely school bus driver in Queens. Well, that sounds sort of that Winston. was an inspiration right. to Good, children. Like Tuesday nights on CBS, actually, or a, a crummy, or a total doing? crackhead. <laughs> Yeah. Or both. Dead crackhead. <laughs> okay, okay. Could be, well, believe in yourself. Right. Yeah. You could be a school bus driver. Yeah, crackhead. Like, you could have died on the bus. bus crackhead driver. school bus driver. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Which would be good. Like, there's the no Sunday doubt nights in my on mind FX. that would have happened. Yeah. How would I have afforded college? How yeah. would I have possibly? I would have given up. Well, there's one way you could have afforded college. Hmm. If you had agreed to, let's say, look after a blind lunatic for a weekend. Convinced him, kept him from committing suicide. Yes. And then he, you know, does you a favor by representing serving you as your sort of pro bono attorney at a disciplinary no hearing. Wait, in you're front of the repaid with I'm a... the sole witness to a prank. Yep. That His pisses defense off. He's literally like, stop it. This sucks. And is, they're like, yeah. hey, you know what? It does suck. It's just the last three minutes of this movie when you get back down to it. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that. Story. I love the yes, way we walk, we walk about our I way back around. That was beautiful. I replaced thank you. you on Broadway, I just looked up. Walliner 
did replace Jim Wallander. Belushi replaced Judd Hirsch. Hirsch. Yes, it became the Jim Which Belushi Jason Wallander. It's show. Pathetic, but it's a bit of a downgrade. It's a hell of a it's a hell of a leap. <laughs> Yeah. It's just crazy. Like, oh, let me buy tickets to that. Like, oh, well, you're getting Belushi tickets. Uh, and, it <laughs> you're and it was an overtly right, Jewish right, play. It was an overtly Jewish play. Right. And right. and Jim Belushi, and who's Albanian. Yes. And uh, yeah. I remember seeing it with Jim Belushi. Yeah. How and going, it? what the hell's going on here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> also, what uh, happened? Jason Biggs was in it. I'm seeing Jason it Biggs played my older brother. Yeah. That's wow. Mm -hmm. uh, young Jason Biggs. Yeah. Little Biggs. And Hirsch won the Tony. He just, did. For I best just, actor. That's I googled. Correct. And then you worked with and Tony Shalhoub played. Yes, Tony Shalhoub. I played him as a child. Yes. Uh, Wild. Yeah. It's a great uh, play. Great play. Yeah. You worked with her so much again later. Is he just the best? You know, when I first worked with him, he was doing Dear John, and he was really kind of bold and brash. And I don't want to say he wasn't the best. He was the best, but he also had a, an ego thing happening. Later on. The greatest. Yeah. Hilarious, wacky, and super strong. Uh, you know, physically Physical, and mentally, yeah. like crazy. Yeah. That guy's going to live well past 100. It, it is. He's it, 89 now. Watching He's interviews with him now. Like it, the yeah. There's looks, no stopping him. But when he was on, like, the Fableman's press tour, when he was doing his, like, Oscar season gauntlet, you're like, oh, he's playing old in the Fableman's. Right. He's right. acting to seem more feeble and out of it. Mm-hmm. And, like, this guy's, like, at full fighting weight. He is an ox. Yeah. yeah he's a big boy. He is something big, else, yeah. man. I yeah. mean, that, they don't make him like that anymore. He's well, a tough, should. tough guy. We should clone him. We should have an army of Hershes. We got to restart the Yiddish theater. That's what we got to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, when this movie, the last 30 minutes, boils down to, like, this insane ersatz hearing. I mean, it's awful. What? No I, I school just keep does going, this. like, first of all, no school does nothing, none of this, as Ben has said before, this isn't real. It doesn't what is make this? This sense. isn't a thing. It would make more sense if then June Squibb got up and was like, we don't really know why we're here. This is a very strange proceeding and we, the disciplinary board, whoever we are, but reject it. Speaking of this movie being like 10 degrees off from like an absurdist comedy, you're like, this is like the end of Billy Madison <laughs> where they're all admitting like this whole like yes. setup is insane. But it has like the proceeding of like the end of Harry Potter where Dumbledore is like, Harry Potter, you 11 year old for killing Voldemort. Uh, 50 points and yeah. everyone's like yay and you're like what is the, the you know the high low tone of it yes it's the same thing here he's basically everyone's just trying to humiliate him Pacino calls it out and then June Squibb is like our verdict is he's bad he's bad he's fine see you all later also the right. stakes of this are a prank right where a rich old man was embarrassed like nothing really happened and we don't and there's no emotional like is there ever a moment in this film where Pacino goes, you know why I want to kill myself? Because I hate myself. I'm a terrible person. I did terrible things and I'm bad. Not I'm the problem. Really. Not really. Not no. really. Not really. Kind of Instead, he's dancing around it. He's yeah. dancing around it too much. Yes. yes. Had there been that moment. Yeah. Maybe it's a watchable movie. Yeah. But the 30 years is, later, O'Donnell doesn't turn him around with anything good either, except like, come on, don't right, do that. Right. You but shouldn't that, do that. But that's also why this is a bad performance, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, if we're talking about like the weirdness of acting, which I do mm -hmm. think is the interesting thing to talk about here, like the, the thing with this movie, I, I will say like backhandedly, uh, is it's like it is watchable, right? It is it's fairly incredibly it's long, long, but it is exhausting. Yeah, right. right. But like, and I would never give Breast an Oscar nomination for this in a million years, but you also understand why the Academy is like, it's Tony, it's classy, it kind of has like, it's smooth, mm -hmm. you know, it has these like big emotional waves and big scenes and whatever, it's in focus, the score is lush, like all this sort of shit. And in the same way, you're like, everything Pacino is doing is compelling, it is mm -hmm. certainly watchable. Right. Which, like... There it's is a just, spectacle to some extent. Right. And you rarely... Like, people who don't see performances by people who truly cannot act, because almost anyone who ends up in any professional-level project has some modicum of, if not, like, skill or craft, at least some innate charisma mm -hmm. that at least makes them, like, compelling in that frame. Mm -hmm. The people who have none of that barely end up on a radar where anyone could even see them. Right. But you're like, the reason I think this is a bad performance is you're like, he's not playing the story of this 
well. No. He is not serving what this movie should be. He's making the mistake of playing the persona. Yes. Of the guy. Yes. Rather than there's a human being behind this persona he's yes. put up so that we get the sense as an audience, oh, this is who he has Why to be. Why is he doing He this? feels he has to be this person. Right. Because he can't live down his mistakes, but there's this other person behind him. Right. And so it's not in the case. writing. No. Correct. It's not in the writing. It's just a flat one note character all the way fucking through. But this kind of movie star, to a certain extent, if it's not there in the writing, part of their job is to be like, we have to fucking find the center of this. Hua. Right. We need to do a couple drafts. Instead, That's he was like, Hua. here's here's the spine. I say Hua. So who's at fault? Is it Brest, Pacino, Bo Goldman? Is that I, his name? I, Bo Goldman's the writer. I would say Brest is most at fault. I here. think Brest He's is the one most who can rein him yes. in. I agree. But then Brest is like, what are you talking about? I made but, a hit movie that won an Oscar. Right. Well, here's the other thing. So yeah. then why, you learn no lessons right. from that because you're what like, happens. I was rewarded. But yeah. here's what happens on yeah. movies, right? Here's what happens. You can be Martin Brest. You can make three great movies in a row. You can have worked with De Niro and whatever. Got a great performance out of De Niro and Grodin. You get on that set and the elephant walks in the room. The big gorilla, yeah. Al Pacino, you don't tell me how to act. I'm Al Pacino. Yeah. Now, maybe Pacino doesn't say that, but the air is There's there. Air. There's an air of Pacino's God. Yeah. We don't tell. I'm, my job is not to direct Pacino. Meanwhile, we- it, like, In fact, I don't even want to take the chance because right? what if Pacino yells at Anything me? he's giving me is gold. Before you know it, it's now Pacino directing the movie. Which, by the way, if you're just sitting behind the monitor watching Pacino do take after take out of this, you are like, this is compelling. He's doing a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. But that's the moment where your job as the director is to zoom out and go like, big picture. Correct. Track the performance. Yes. If he's not doing it. Right. Because it's really Pacino's responsibility to track the performance, especially if he knows he's not being directed. But then, breast at someone has to be sitting there going, good Lord, it's the same shit over and over in every yes. scene. Yes. To be fair. The movie is also just not very well written. And what are you going to do, I guess? Like, it's a silly movie. I don't know if I'm breast if I'm going to come in and be like, th th this is, oh, uh, I'm blind. Like, you know, I don't know what he's supposed to be no, doing. No, no. Um, let me tell you who he beat for best actor. Robert Downey Jr. for Chaplin. Clint Eastwood for Unforgiven. Stephen Ray for The Crying Game. Mm -hmm. And Denzel Washington for Malcolm X, which is, Whoa. of course, the that's, kind of like, sorry, right, that's the outrageous. searing yes. one. Now, that's outrageous. Denzel had just won an Oscar three years prior. Mm -hmm. Neither it's still do insane. I. Uh, and, and Pacino, of course, had never won an Oscar. And that is why I think this is the totemic, like, that's why you don't want to get into a makeup Oscar situation. Yes. I don't want to call the Academy racist, or at least racist well, at that 1992 time. 1992 Academy. But my God almighty. Real bad. The greatest, in my opinion, hands down the greatest biopic ever made. Is Malcolm yeah. X. Yeah. I, it's, and that I, movie wasn't not the only nomination it got was Denzel. I yeah, uh, right? Yes. And maybe some creative it's like, like costume design. art That's stuff. The only yeah. Other yeah. One. Yeah, yeah, insane. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. yeah. That movie's a masterpiece. Um, yes, correct. So that's it's just a crazy situation. You look at that. You're like, he's the worst of those five actors. Yeah. Not only that, I mean, I think Downey Jr. and Chaplin is the the second worst, and that's a really interesting performance. That movie's kind of like all over the movie is bad. Place. I think he's he's great. phenomenal in it. Eastwood is incredible in Unforgiven. Yeah. Like, yes. I mean, it's his best screen acting ever, probably. Stephen Ray is getting the crying game nom. Like, sure, you'll only right. get a nom there, but that's that guy's a legend. And then fucking Malcolm X. Like, yeah, yeah. It's and wild. instead it's Pacino, because it has to be. It's not just that he gave a big performance. They're just like, we cannot. Skip out on this. It again. was Pacino's time. Cha Chaplin Downey Jr. is, I mean, uh, echoing what you said a couple minutes ago. Mm. He's like, at that time, I worked so hard. I thought I deserved that Oscar. I was mm. really crushed. I didn't win it. If I had won it, I would be dead. Right. He's like, if I had gotten the encouragement at that moment in my career of like, by the way, kid, you're better than Clint Eastwood, Al Pacino, and, and, and Denzel, Denzel Washington. I would have yeah. been dead within five years. There yeah. would have been no limit to my self-destruction. Right, right. Yeah. No, I know I know an alcoholic uh, writer, comedy writer, who's a recovering alcoholic. He was won several Emmys. And if you go to his house, they're nowhere in sight. Yeah. You say, where are your Emmys? And he says, oh, if I, if I even right. look at I them, if, I know, if I'm in the same room as them, I, yeah. will, I will become a full-blown alcoholic again. Yeah. 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 Box office game. We're going to do the weekend it went wide, Griffin, rather than, because Christmas, okay. we've already done that weekend. And it doesn't, you know, we'll do it. So this is January 8th, 1993. We're going to guess the top five movies of this weekend, David. Sense of Woman's at number three. 
uh, with $8 million, it's going to make it all the way to 60 plus. What's number one, Griffin? It is it's a Best Picture nominee this year. Big hit drama. Good movie. Better movie than this. Un- well, is it you un- just gave it a, it's Unforgiven. It's not Unforgiven. No, because Unforgiven is like a very slow burn. Unforgiven had come Unforgiven out. Unforgiven won. It did win it did. one, but, it did, it did. but this is a nominee. This is just, this is up against Unforgiven. Okay. Unforgiven yeah, right. stat it had for a while that I think it maybe still holds is that it was the slowest it has ever taken any movie to get to $100 million. It played for like a full year. Yeah, it had come out in August. Yeah. I assume after it wins Best Picture, it gets a bit of a sort of bump. And, and, yeah. and we know Malcolm X wasn't nominated. So no. it's not that. No, nope. And it's not Crying Game. No, it's not The Crying Game. And it's uh, these not. These movies are floating around in the sort of 20s. Right. Know. But it's a Best Picture nominee in 1992. Yep. Big hit movie. Highly rewatchable and quotable. It's big. not The Fugitive? Is it big? No. Nope. 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 What genre? Legal. Oh, drama. it's I not Few Good Men. It is Few Good Men. That's oh, the God. same year as this. Yes. Wow. So him Nicholson doing Few Good Men mm. over Scent of a Woman is really well, interesting but, when you consider them being at the same time. Correct, but that's a supporting performance. Right. Yeah. And I believe Nicholson was nominated. He for was best nominated. Support. It was, lost but that's like Jackman for Unforgiven. In, mm-hmm. in in history, mm-hmm. in long view history. That was the smarter decision for him. Oh, 100 To do five days on well, Few Good Men. Sense of Woman, he's like, I mean, in Few Good Men, right? yeah. I'll uncork it for two great scenes. That's like, you the know, right amount. Be, right. He understands be. the function of that part, which is get that big for five mm-hmm. minutes. Like, imagine mm-hmm. if he yelled, you can't handle the truth at everyone for two hours. Anyway, number two right. at the box office. Gigantic animated film. But, you know, biggest movie. Aladdin. Aladdin. Yeah. Aladdin. Okay. Aladdin. 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 So Aladdin. Few Good Men, Aladdin, Scent of a Woman. Number four, another smash hit of 1992. It's been out for two months. Big drama. Uh, drama. Malcolm X? Sort of, oh. no. It's like sort of like a thriller, but like it's like a romantic thriller. It's hard to categorize it's a romantic thriller drama? Yes. Weird. Yes, that's what Wikipedia calls it. Wow, I nailed it. It's not romantic basic instinct. Drama. No, it's lighter than that. It's lighter than that. It's, it's more romantic than erotic. Yes, yes, exactly. What is it? More I said it's not basic than, like, erotic. Yeah. Who who is the, the, the distributor of this picture? Uh it's being put out by Warner Brothers. Hmm. British director. Hmm. It's a British director. British director. It's not uh, a uh, uh, as it is it's Freers. It's dangerous it, liaisons. It's not dangerous liaisons, Uh-oh. it's a great guess. Yeah. Hmm. It's trashier than that. It's trashier. Than uh, and giant, is it is it a period? Is it an Adrian piece? Line? No, not, not a period that piece. trashy. Fuck. It's not a period we're piece. So we're not just hovering around this the is extremes. A huge movie. Oh, Notting Hill. Not Notting Hill. You're Uh-oh. a few years off there. It was okay. a it's an American huge, movie, British director. It's an American movie with a British director. It was huge. Giant movie star and then an even bigger celebrity. Oh, it's The Bodyguard. It's The Bodyguard. Oh, oh The Bodyguard. The Bodyguard. Sure. Kevin Costner, Whitney Houston. Who directed Mike Newell? Mick Jackson. Mick Jackson. The guy who did L.A. Story. I worked with he Mick did Jackson. Pres- really? What? Mick Jackson like? Mick Jackson directed The Pilot of Numbers. Wild. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Was he nice? Extremely. Uh, number five, I feel like, is the only movie in this top five that's kind of forgotten. Okay. Uh, yeah, because it's a big five. Yeah, well, it's Christmas time, you know. Uh, it's uh, a drama, a sort of weepy fantasy romantic drama uh, with a big movie star. The, the poster is his fucking face. Is it Forever Young? It's Forever Young. Forever Mel Young. Mel Gibson is Forever Young. young. That's the one, no, that's not the one where he has, that's the man with two faces. No, man yeah. with two faces man, or no Man with face. no face. No, no face. face. Right. Right. Not even a face. Two faces. Two faces. Right. He, two directed he, that? Have any. he directed that. Forever, Forever young, young is the one where he like wakes up from like a time capsule. Yeah, like cryonic mm. freezing and then he starts aging really quickly. Mm. It's, but it's written by J.J. Right. first script. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, but I think it's like a derided movie. Like it was a flop. Yes. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. yeah like yeah. it was a cheesy movie. You know? Yeah. It's like serious blast from the past. Although it, it beat blast from the past. You've the also punch. got number six, Home Alone 2. Uh-huh. Talk right. about Pesci being funny. Yeah. Uh, number three, cha- number seven, Chaplin. Uh, sure. You know, big Oscar movie. Number eight, new this week, because uh, it is January, Leprechaun, the horror Leprechaun. film. Leprechaun. Leprechaun. Uh, with Warwick Davis uh-huh. and Jennifer Aniston. Uh-huh. Number nine, a big Oscar flop of this year, Jack Nicholson again in Hoffa, the Danny oh, DeVito yeah. movie. Which is actually a great movie. It's not a bad yeah, movie. Not Very bad good movie. But yeah. Danny DeVito did a great job. DeVito's a fucking good ass director. Yeah, he yeah. is yeah. a good director. Uh, and number 10, a movie we were recently discussing, The Distinguished Gentleman, the uh, oh, uh, Eddie, Murphy. Eddie Murphy Congress Ooh, comedy. God. Now that's a movie that people have forgotten that, for yes. good reason. Yes. Time has forgotten. Cheryl Lee Ralph. The great Cheryl Lee Ralph. I, I made She's the argument. Right. And Lane Smith, yeah. who is 
he must play the the meanest congressman in that movie. Well, I, mean, I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love Lane Smith. David and I were talking about how as children, seeing the cover of that movie's video box, which I don't know if you remember, the poster is a painting, and he's lifting the lid off the Capitol. Okay. And he's like pulling money out of it. Right. As if it were a piggy bank. I remember it now that you right. brought it. Yeah. And we as children both were like, this is a movie about a giant man <laughs> who's just stealing money. And they're huge dollar bills <laughs> stuck inside a building. Like we just absolutely literal face value. Yeah. What is the premise of this film? Right. That was the moment that Eddie Murphy really started with the equivalent of what Botox would be like. He started like really trimming his eyebrows. <laughs> Really glad, you know, a little yes. too much eyeliner. Yes, you know. Yes, and and you went. Wait a second. Is he trying to be handsome? Yes, because he's handsome. But we kind of liked it that he was. That's his period. And Boomerang is yes. right before that. Yes, I want right. to say. Right. It's like but Boomerang before. is very funny. Yeah, distinguished funny. gentleman is not funny. No, but Boomerang is about like it, obviously like a, a player, like a about player. So right. you believe right. that okay, right. he looks right. good. He's kind of going yeah. for it out but there. But then right. yeah, I remember the distinguished gentleman and thinking, uh oh, yes, that was a big uh oh moment. But it yeah. is in the top ten. Barely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Uh, that is. That is our podcast, basically, Griffin. We're, we're basically done, right? Yeah. Is there anything else? I just had a quick merch spotlight. I just sent a link over. Okay, Ben. Uh, perfume. It's, uh, available to buy right now called Scent of a Woman. Yep. Uh, it's uh, available at Costco's. Uh, my, my browser is concerned that I even opened this link. I got a pop-up worried <laughs> about me. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do love how uh, that just with Gabriel Lamar, he's like, do I smell soap and water? And I'm like... Like, do you, do you not smell that on everybody? One would yeah, hope. Most people One bathe. would hope. Yeah. It's also <laughs> insane that he would know all of these different perfumes. Mm -hmm. Where well, did he learn? You have to understand. I can super smell. Right, but be able to define them by name. It's, it's the, like he uh, like would go Rain to Macy's Man, like, and oh, that's hang out. Noir. <laughs> That's Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> in Rain Man, you're like, look, this is a somewhat cartoonish representation of like severe autism, but we understand there are people you know, who have this sure. kind of mental ability, right, to do math in their head and all that. And this is just like, he's blind, so he knows all the perfumes. Like, it's the worst logic leap in I have a subscription to the Braille edition of Vogue magazine, and I open that flap with the perfume sample, and I never forget a smell. <laughs> he charms Francis Conroy at the end of the movie. I mean, like, is it this one? And she's like, oh, yes, it is. And you're like, oh, Pacino's going to be okay. He's going to date this lady now. You smell like Clubman Talc. <laughs> David, I know you said uh, that you uh, 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 no longer like being called an actor's actor, but the uh, anecdote yeah. you threw out about working on the Santa Claus uh, performance, so iconic, it's mm. now immortalized in emoji form, mm. uh, about <laughs> like already thinking about how you, you fit into it. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, should I be the Bill Murray in this movie and whatever? That is like the thing I have always loved about you as an actor and talking about like, the weirdness of this craft and how Pacino is sort of out of sync of in this movie and all this sort of shit. You're a guy where I'm like, you always know exactly what you're in. I Every performance I've seen from you, I just feel like you understand the exact function of the type of film you're in, the language of the movie you're in, what your character needs to do. Yeah, I, th I credit my dad. He just took me to so many movies. There and I lo and I loved movies. I love movies. I just love movies. He didn't hesitate to take me to really weepy dramas. Yeah. You know, I just learned genres. Like, it wasn't, you know. That's great. Yeah. I'm lucky. I'm really lucky in that regard. You know, my dad, my dad literally didn't know what else to do with me. Yeah. And it worked out. Yeah. In my yeah. It's a good story. My dad was just a simple guy and he was like, let movies teach him how to live. Let, you know, let that be his liberal education. Just movies. Midnight run. Midnight Don't run. ask me for advice. Yeah. Never go on a midnight run. That's right. These things go down. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Dude, you're the man. You're the thank man. you, Sims. Why am I, why are we, why don't we call him? Mr. Sims. Oh, we, I know no one even brought up the I said it a couple times. times. Ben brought it up too. Ben said we should only call you Mr. Sims. Also two it's, Davids it's, on the it's, same It's show. a 2M Sims, which I'm often hit with the two M's. I only have one M. Just one M for me. Uh, Lousy Carter. Yeah. Lousy Carter out on VOD. Martin Any, Starr, Olivia Thirlby. Correct. Oh, I love them. It's not a terrible movie. <laughs> hey, fuck. I'm in. You know? I mean, a pitch like that. It's really not bad. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything else coming up? No. You want to plug? No? No. Not literally, no. 
Uh, thank you for being here, Dave. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for helping to produce the show. Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Kalei Montgomery in the Great American Novel for our theme song. J.J. Birch for our research. A.J. McKeon for our editing. A.J. McKeon is also our production coordinator. I said everybody? Yeah. Yeah. It gets hard to remember. I remember how all of them smell. That A.J. McKeon... He sure does smell like your classic old spice. It smells like soap but and shampoo. Yeah, but it's deceiving. It's actually Pantene Pro-V. <laughs> do I smell sweat? Are you a human being? I do know that JJ is a Garnier Fructis man. <laughs> Herbal essences. <laughs> Lynn Montgomery, Pantene Pro-V all the way. Mm. Ain't nothing but Paul Mitchell. <laughs> Uh, you go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon Blank Check special features, where we're finally onto tabletop games. Or are we still doing toidles? I don't remember. Doesn't Let's matter. take a look. I think it matters. I actually, David, I do think it matters. Okay, uh, we are of course uh, still doing turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows next. Out there. of the Shadows, yes. a film we enjoyed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, tune in next week for Meet Joe Black. Thankfully, Martin Brest is going to uh, Add swerve a, away from this movie with a twenty-five minutes. longer, weirder, weepier, yeah, less star funny. vehicle. Yeah, <laughs> what a weird career. Uh, and as always, yeah. Oh wow, very good. Thank you.